What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another Art of War stream. We've got a super exciting one for you today. It's going to be a tier list for the brand new 10th edition Tau Codex, ranking all the different data sheets, including the Imperial Armor stuff. So if you want a synopsis of where all the different units fit, and which ones you're gonna to wanna to take in all your lists, which ones you need to be thinking about, and which ones you might wanna avoid, then this is going to be the video for you. If you like this type of content, please give us a like, subscribe to the channel, and tell your friends about us. All of that massively helps us grow this YouTube channel. In addition, please leave a comment below letting us know what you were most excited for in the 10th edition Tau Codex, as well as what you think of our tier list. Now, I am joined by a very special guest here, one of the preeminent Tau players in the world, Mr. Kyle Grundy from the Puritide program. Kyle, thank you so much for joining me. Hi there, Richard. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Uh, you are a legend in your own right, and you've been doing amazing stuff on the UKTC scene. And, um, you know, if people were to look for awesome Tau content out there, where could they go? Okay, so I have a couple of sources. I have my YouTube channel, Pure Type Program, and I also have uh, links to my Discord within that that you can find. And it's a fantastic community that's grown over the year. You've got uh, a free aspect to it, so you can just join, chat, Tau, uh, law discussion, list discussions, and just be a part of the community that I've built over the last year. And if you're wanting that extra uh, performance boost and you want to know a bit more about the top level tactics and the things that I've been doing over the course of the last year, you can actually sign up to my patrons of the PureTab program with three different tiers from Pathfinder all the way to Chasse to Chassel. And honestly, the community that we built over the year, it's amazing. So you definitely want to go and check that out. And that's where you can find it, mainly on Discord and YouTube. Absolutely. And the community is amazing. I'm in there myself occasionally, uh, thanks to Kyle's generosity. And uh, I love hanging out with Tau people talking. So if that's something you're about, you should really check it out. Awesome community. In addition, if you want more content from me about Tau, check out our war room, thewarroom.vhx.tv, where you can join uh, with a three-day free trial and check out all the Tau stuff. I put out Mon Call list review, Retaliation Conjure review, and uh, a game against some Space Marines, some Ultramarine Gladius. If you want to check out some immediate Tau content and uh, get some ideas, uh, check out the war room. Okay, without further ado, let's go ahead and talk about this tier list. Uh, now, Kyle and I have done a tier list before, and we use a similar ranking system. And if you saw that one, we're going to use something pretty similar in this one. And so we've got a bunch of different tiers here to rank each of the units. And when we talk about the unit, we're going to usually focus on its best attachment and rank it based on that. Uh, so if it's not particularly good in a one specific detachment, but really good in another one, we will rank it based on its best attachment. I think that is uh, probably the best way to go. And we're going to start off with um, the not rarely seen. Why did that? Why did that change? You're not rarely seen. Your tournament. Oh man, Kyle, it switched. <laughs> Look at this. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, just drop this out of the way, and you are going. Sorry. To... All right, man. Just put crisis suits at rarely seen. Exactly. Okay, <laughs> I'm just going to drop that out of there. I don't know why it doubled, but we're going to start with tournament staple. And Tournament Staple is going to be all of those different units that you basically are going to see in every single list. Regardless of detachment, they probably fit into almost all of them. They're just that good, that efficient. Uh, following that is Solid Choice. This one's just probably good in most detachments. Maybe it has a best one, and then it's okay in the others. But if you want to add this into your list, you won't ever feel bad about doing so, and it'll perform the role that you want perfectly. Uh, then we have Situational. Situational is going to be, it very much has a niche role. Maybe in certain matchups is very good. Maybe it's the case where if you need to do one particular thing, it does that one thing good, but really doesn't have many other roles. Um, situational kind of fit that. Then Minimally Useful is basically, uh, you might have a couple niche scenarios where you might want this, or very likely it is going to overlap with other roles and just not do them as well. That's probably where some of those units are going to fit. And then rarely seen is quite obvious. It's almost never going to be seen. Maybe it's based on the points. Maybe it's based on the, um, you know, the particular data sheet rule that it has, which isn't particularly enticing. But we're probably not going to be seeing too, too many of those units. Now, in terms of points, we are going to be using the current MFM for uh, most of these Tau units. Anything that has an existing data sheet and existing MFM points will be you know judged based on that in addition to its actual rules 
And then uh, if it doesn't have current MFM points, like the new crisis suits or some of the new crew units, we will be basically basing them off of what we think is going to be you know, a reasonable place to put them based on their rules mostly. We're gonna overvalue the rules. So for the crew, they have some ludicrous points in here. That's never gonna be real. I mean, nobody with their right mind would think those are real. So it's really harsh to base them specifically off of those points. So instead, we're gonna base them mostly all over the rules themselves because they can easily go down 15, 20, et cetera points. And then you're gonna really wanna value those particular rules. So we're gonna do something a little unique because we don't have uh, whatever the new MFM is going to say these are. All right, Kyle, anything you wanna to add to that synopsis? I think you've pretty much hit on the net head, to be honest. Now, how do you feel about rotating on and off of these uh, different units here? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, okay. Well, we're gonna go through, like I said, every single uh, data sheet in the codex, which I believe is 38, and then we're gonna do all of the Imperial Armor ones as well. So would you like to start off? Or would you like me to start off? I'll start off. All right. So let's go straight in with uh, the Warlord herself, mm -hmm. Commander Shadowson. So pretty much remain the same in terms of her utility and the guns. Um, and what I think for her is that she's going to probably sit between tournament staple and solid choice to begin with. Um, the reason I believe that this is the case is because the ability to potentially get a CP back on a 5 plus is going to be so important now that we've got more stratagems. And even those that are battle tactic, let's say in Mont Car, for example, and you can get some of those uh, stratagems used for free with like Farsight, then you can actually generate a CP on spending zero CP. And I think it can be really clutch. So I would probably put her as a solid choice, but she could go into tournament staple at the beginning. What are your thoughts? I think that's pretty realistic. Uh, at the end of the day, she is one of the cheaper loan ops you can access and one that actually yeah. does something. And without Anva now, she's probably the next best loan op to take before you decide to spend all the extra points on a ghost kill. So uh, she has that role going for her. In addition, reroll ones in an aura is not the best rule for this army because there are other ways to get access to rerolls mm -hmm. uh, in whether detachment wise or from other data sheets but she in manka uh, because you kind of don't want to spend tons of points on tetris since you can get full rerolls over the course of the game via that stratagem uh pinpoint uh pinpoint something pinpoint offensive the yeah. um this means that you don't want to spend tons and tons of points on tetris you don't want to go you know two three units of them you might only go for one unit of them. And in that case, having the rerolls early game can be pretty valuable. And then like you said, the CP thing is, is almost certainly the biggest. Tau have some very good strats over uh, several detachments and really want to be procking that as much as possible. And if you're somebody who picks fix secondaries over tactical, where you uh, can ge uh, generate extra CP in other ways, then Shadow Sun is a great choice for fixed lists, in my opinion. So yeah, yeah. I think the... Um... I think the thing you mentioned there about um, the low and op is really important, especially if you wanted to play around with the Kion detachments, being able to do Wall of Mirrors with her. She can be a solid secondary achiever, um, just not jumping around the board, popping up in places where you might need the reroll ones. I found the reroll ones are really useful for things like uh, Riptides, but with what you said about the no longer really needing the Tetra rerolls, and even the stealth suits with reroll ones to hit now and ones to wound can actually mitigate not taking shadow sun so before in our index she was absolutely really useful for real ones now not so much yeah which is interesting because it is a good ability uh, but she's like oh, a yeah. complete package she gives you a lot of different things and um i think she is absolutely a solid choice she can fit her into any detachment and you won't feel bad uh, about doing that whatsoever she's just a very right. solid unit i don't think she's tournament staple because i don't think she's going to be just jam slotted into every list I think mm. um, some lists, especially those that lean on fixed secondaries, will probably go grab her, but I think leaving her out is, is totally reasonable. Yeah, and I think she'd probably be the first thing you'd chop in the list if you had to get 100 points for something else. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I think solid choice, perfectly reasonable. Moving on to our next warlord, uh, Commander Farsight. He gained two additional wounds because uh, he's not allowed to take drones, and it was kind of silly that he had uh, two less wounds than like an Enforcer Commander <laughs> or Cold Star. So they gave him the extra wounds, and then they got rid of his full rerolls to hit and wound in melee once per game, which was, was hilarious. But uh, this rule that he gained, uh, Pure Tide's teachings, 
is much better. And that's once per battle round, you can target the model's unit for a stratagem for zero CP. And even if you use that strat already. And in Monka, this is nutty because there are several really good battle tactics, including aggressive mobility, allowing you to go ahead and flat six advance somewhere else, then do it on his unit for free. Very strong. There's a bunch of other battle tactics um, that you can potentially use this on. And then um, you could use this free CP reroll if you really wanted to. In Retaliation Kadra, unfortunately, the Arakan Protocol is the only one that you can use this ability on, which is a little unfortunate. Once again, I don't think that data slate change was really, uh, you know, in people's minds when they designed this book. So what I would like for a lot of these abilities is you go back in and you set, you you pick off certain stratagems that you can actually zero CP, which would be a lot more uh, interesting. But he is fantastic. He gives you plus one to wound for your unit when you're within nine, and whether you're in retaliation cadre, where you can just be 3.1 away and easily within fusion range and uh, also plus one to wound, or whether you're in Monka where you can just move the unit 16 inches uh, guaranteed and then hit them uh, within nine. He's awesome. He is a fantastic character. I really think that he's going to see, he's auto choice in my opinion in Monka because of this free strat ability and the battle tactics they have. I don't think you have to run him in Retaliation Kadra, but he's, he's really quite good in Retaliation <laughs> uh, um, Kadra, whether it's the uh, the Sunforge unit or the um, the Star Scythe oh, unit. I, yeah. yeah, I think he's he's I think he's tournament staple in my opinion. What do you feel? Yeah, so I think he I would agree that he's a tournament staple um, because, like I said, in the Retaliation Cadre, he can just give a fusion unit to plus one to wound or anything else like the Flamers um, with plus one to wound at potential strength six uh, AP stumped something I think AP two. Um, you can get him too. So I think he is a tournament staple if you're going for the builds in Montcar automatically. Um, and I also think that I like how he's an auto include tournament staple in Montcar, which let's let's be honest, he should be. He's the the big daddy of the he's killing master. blow. <laughs> and I think um, Shadow Sun would be a, an auto including Kion. So I like what they kind of done there. That, so, yeah, yeah, which it, it was funny because for a while um, you would see a lot of the Kalyan lists with Farsight early on in the uh, index days, with not too many Shadow Sun, and then it kind of swipped, uh, you know, swatch, you know, switched back and forth between them. So, yeah, I think Farsight's awesome now in Moncob, but you can absolutely not feel bad about running him in any of the attachments. He really helps the Sunforge hit, um, you know, do mm. a lot of damage into uh, some of the more durable T eleven plus type of vehicles and monsters oh yeah absolutely so i agree uh, it's a shame he lost his um what was it the way of the short blade it was yeah, called when it was, oh, was it way of the short blade it was they could have just left that blade? in there frankly yeah because it was just fluffy mm. um but yeah they, they took that away but i'll take zero cp uh and, and also, with the CP also he's got a two plus save now mm -hmm. yeah he's basically mm -hmm. an enforcer commander uh which is yeah. significantly better which is mad because wasn't he meant to be in a special cold suit, cold star? He is in a Nova cold star suit, a supernova cold star suit, I believe is what it's called. Um, so yeah, I, I I think they just threw names out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <You> <laughs> but it sounds cool. <laughs> All right, I'll let you uh, take over the enforcer, commander. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think the enforcer, um, straight off, I'm not gonna mess around. Tournament staple. Um, with Crisis Suits now um, only having one variant, the Sunforge, that'll have an invon. Um, the I keep calling them Death Rain because I think that's what they were in the third edition. If you take the Fire Knife with missile pods and or potentially plasmas, I'm favoring the missile pods. I think the Enforcer going in there, giving you effectively free armor of contempt. So when uh, while this model is leading a unit, each time a range attack targets that unit, worse than the armor penetration characteristic of that attack by one. Um, and that's a really good ability to keep your crisis suits ticking over rather than just dying to lots of AP2. Um, so you can actually, in some cases, against indirect, um, what, AP3 goes to AP2 with cover, then you worsen it by one, AP1, so it puts you on a four plus save anyway, which is what you were relying on when your crisis had invulnerable. So I think he's an automatic, uh, for a tournament staple, should we say. And then in terms of the way that you load him out, I don't know what your opinion is, Richard, but I kind of like to keep it in sync with the unit. So if my fire knife's going all missile pods, I'll have him with all missile pods. So I think he's great. 
Yeah, so Armor of Contempt is something that's extremely strong across the game, such abilities mm -hmm. like Void Armor and Votan as well. Um, now, Crisis Suits, unfortunately, can't get Iridium Armor. I think if it was Iridium Armor, that you would take like two to three Enforcers all the time because yeah, the time. two up save uh, Armor of Contempt is a different beast when you're sitting in cover. But um, if you do, I agree, if you want to run the Fire Knife and the um, Star Scythe units, he is the big bonus that you're going to get. Uh, because in the Retaliation Cadre, mm -hmm. the mobility of the Cold Star is nice, but it's so easy with Rapid Ingress plays, especially because you want to run more Stealth Suits uh, for that free ability. And then uh, the 3.1 away, you can basically get wherever you need. And if you're taking Missile Pods, like you said, then the range game isn't, you know, as needed and then you can play that range game as well with the missile pods in Monka and gain access to plus one ep so regardless of where you're putting them if you're running the non sunforge variant where i think farsight really excels in that particular unit um, as well as the cold star i think the other two much prefer the enforcer and if you're going to run them the enforcer is basically an auto take um, and then he gets their rules too is like yeah, the he fact gets that, that he gets their rules too. puts him over the edge Absolutely. And I think um, when I was looking at the um, the typical loadouts that I would go with and thinking, oh, the Enforcers, obviously, he's really tough. He's tanky. He's got a two plus save. You could potentially kit him out with two shield drones for eight wounds. Mm -hmm. But I'm favoring the marker drone and shield drone. I thought, well, he's moving eight. Oh, I wonder if there's an, uh, an ability that allows him to, oh, hello, star flare uh, ignition system. So it allows you just to do the up and downsies. And mm -hmm. pick him up at the end of the opponent's fight phase in the retaliation cadre. Excellent. Put that in an enforcer. Yeah, so whatever flank, like your opponent's like, okay, well, there's two Riptides, there's a crisis unit with missile pods over here. I'm not gonna I'm gonna avoid it. I'm gonna go to the other one where there's only one Riptide. And you're like, well, don't worry, there's yep. also now a crisis suit <laughs> unit. <laughs> yeah. And it's um if you're going second in a game, you can actually do this turn one, providing that uh the you, you might have to double check this in tournaments, but most of it will allow it. It's like the Necrons Hypercrypt thing, I don't know, in the WTC and the uh, UKTC, um, we're allowed to do it. So potentially, you can do it turn one if you're going second. Yeah, and that's because they awesome. have access to Deep Strike. Um, but yep, yeah, that's definitely a tournament ruling. Now, if you don't, if you are only going for Sunforge or you're not going for Crisis Suits, then his value as a solo character uh, is much less great than it was previously, in my opinion. Four cyclics on a commander coming in for, you know, 90 points was pretty darn strong. Um, mm. That is dead. So he doesn't put as much firepower out, and then if he's not in the unit, he doesn't get one of the cool data sheet rules from the new crisis units. So if you're thinking about solo commanders, probably um, I wouldn't run him, because um, I don't think solo commanders are going to be particularly good. Uh, but if you are running those two units, then he's absolutely up here. Yeah. Right. So, do you want to walk yeah. us through the Cold Star, my friend? Mr. Cold Star. So, the Cold Star, I think, really helps the fusion units. So, if you run multiple units of the Sunforge, I really quite like the Cold Star because he gives them the mobility to get within Melter range. And then, um, if you need to, for instance, punch through some extra damage, because it's six fusion shots. As soon as your opponent has an invul on their key target, or it's higher than, uh, you know, a strength or toughness 10. Um, or, you know, if it's like T11, T12, anywhere in there where you're wounding on fives for the most part, you're going to want to have some additional firepower. And the Cold Star being able to go in there, add in, I like the high output on him because honestly, eight shots is just solid when you get real wounds in, like against Catan specifically, where they're taking a four up, you throw in a bunch of extra wounds from that. It's really nice. And then I probably take one cyclic and two fusion or you say i don't really need the cyclic i'm all anti-tank all day and you take the fusions uh, whichever loadout you go for that adding that extra firepower means you are consistent enough at killing pretty much any of the vehicles out there and i run it a couple times and i felt really good having the commander just make sure i punch through the damage so really like them in those units um being able to move 12 inches on your crisis unit and have the assault keyword is fantastic if you're planning to play a lot of, um, maybe you're playing on terrain where the angles on the sides of the board are not particularly great. I know there's some WTC boards where the terrain literally goes to the edge. And so being able to come up and down has less benefit over there because you're not getting these nice firing angles down the flanks. In that situation, maybe the Cold Star has additional value here because you can play better through the middle 
Um, so I really like him in Sunforge specifically. I don't think because he doesn't give any defensive bonuses, he's quite as good in the other two units. So once again, Enforcer, I think he makes the tournament staple because if you run the other two crisis units, he's fantastic. If you run Sunforge, Cold Star is absolutely a, uh, a viable and strong choice for you. <clears throat> How do you feel? Came to the same conclusion um, because it just makes sense. You know, you want, and also with the fusions um, being 12 inch range, you kind of need that extra bit of speed. I think um, a Cold Star is, again, an automatic pick in your Monk car because being able to go aggressive mobility with one unit and then do it with Farsight, then you're going to have that unit going 18 and you're kind of lessening your failure points by having to roll, oh, I need a four in the advance to get the angle. Oh, I rolled a one. You can just auto advance it. And with the plus two movement, you're increasing your chances of getting into a good position. So yeah, the cold star for me and the enforcers attached to those units, they're both tournament staples. Awesome. Well, I, the funny thing is, I, I think if you remember the last tier list we did, it was a pretty mixed bag. There's some very good mm. options. There's a lot of stuff in the middle, and then there was a decent amount of stuff at the bottom. I frankly think this tier list is going to rank quite a few things pretty highly. I think yeah. the internal balance of this book is much better than the index, in my opinion. Uh, I don't know how you feel about that. I mean, I always was an advocate of that. Uh, our index was one of the best indexes, well, was the best index out there in terms of balance. So I thought they actually nailed it. And in this one, I, one of my things that I was like, fingers crossed for, I was like, please, please, please continue with the internal balance because this is something I'm proud of that GW did with our town. And guess what? They've knocked it out of the park again. I think that there's a full on balance within the different combinations you can do, stratagems, units, synergy, and a couple of little tweaks that obviously they can make and, and improve on. But mm -hmm. I honestly thought that they did a really good job. Yeah, I, I think you and I are both enormously happy with the codex. Obviously, there are some, some things we would like changed. But at the end of the day, like this is exactly where you want a book to be. It's not, it's not overpowered where it's going to be smashing everybody left and right, but it's going to require player skill to get a lot of stuff out of this book. But when you do, it's going to be enormously rewarding. Um, yeah. and I, I'm going to feel very proud playing this Tower Army. And I think <laughs> you, 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 the way that you worded it there, proud, yeah, I echo that because I, I didn't like it when we had all the airburst and SMS spam that we did at <laughs> Sorry, the very beginning. Kyle. And it was just like, oh, I just turn up to the table and win. If I go first, I go second, I just kill you. That bored me. And I actually didn't like playing Tau at that point. I think I had a couple of months out. Um, so I like the fact that this is balanced and it gives us flavors to match your player style. Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on to the Kadra Fireblade. Kadra Fireblade. Okay, let's have a look. The man himself, Mr. Crackshot, Mr. Volleyfire, <laughs> you're taking breaches. This guy is just auto for me. I'd, I'd say if you're taking breaches, especially in the Monk car, um, he's only, well, let's just, he's what, 40 points in the current? Um, 40 points. Point. If you bring any of the enhancements in Monk car, yeah. you're going to be looking at 55 60 to 65. Yeah. So you could do the Conqueror thing to choose um, an objective and have an extra OC. So OC three breaches. Yep. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> um, the Scout move one, uh, I believe you'd have to have him. <clears throat> excuse me, you'd have to have him on the board rather mm -hmm. than in a Devilfish. And um, you could potentially put the choose two units and Scout in Montcar. So if you're looking at your stratagems and your enhancements, then the Catcher Fire Blades going to go really well with uh, Montcar, in my opinion. Um, the I like the fact that they've still um, he can still take two gun drones and then his crack shot ability applies to gun drones, which is funny. Uh, AP three on the roll of a, a critical hit on a six. Um, yeah, cheap, cheerful, does the job, gives you extra shots for your breach unit and just makes them go nuts. So why wouldn't you want that? Yeah, I think in Monka specifically, he's straight up an auto take and tournament yeah. staple, and probably you're taking two to three of them. And the reason is, is because uh, Monka plays the mission style extremely well with the mobility uh, potential of flat six advance. They have assault weapons, so they can very easily get into positions, or you can move advance a devil fish, then disembark them, and their threat range is quite enormous at that point. Now, the strat uh, focused fire is really what puts me, so I was somebody who ran a lot of breachers, but didn't run many fire blades, if any at all. And the reason Same. was is because I wanted to keep them super cheap and have a good, solid trade piece that didn't cost me a ton and didn't bleed, you know, potential assassinate points. Now I flipped to the complete opposite with Monka. And the reason is, is because of focused fire mostly. 
Uh, the uh, strat to disembark from a transport and get reroll wounds is also very good against closest eligible if they're not on an objective. So what do I want with this? Well, plus one AP on two breacher units, when you have the fire blade in there for all the extra shots, it is a ludicrous amount of damage. Um, and like I said, now you can reroll wounds on tar against targets not on an objective if you use that other strat. And uh, man, these guys put out outrageous amounts of firepower, and it's worth it, in my opinion, to run the fire blade. The before it was almost if you ran two fire blades, you could basically get uh, a third, bre you know, extra breacher right. squad instead. And I preferred having the extra OC in the bodies. Now with that focus fire strat, I really think that you want. Every time you activate a breacher unit in that detachment, you want it doing heinous amounts of damage, and the fire blade helps with helps with this. So I think because of that strat, it's really pushed it over the edge where I want the extra damage out of them. So they're not just a mission tool. Now they're actually a key damage dealer in Monka, and yeah. I, I think it's auto taking that detachment. And in terms of spotting for them as well, putting two stealth suits in the rerolling. I know they'd be rerolling wounds anyway, but rerolling one hit, so you don't have to. You could obviously still use a Tetra unit or a Stealth Suit unit, um, but then giving them four rerolls to hit with the Lethals and the extra AP, it's it's insane. The combination, the the, the statistics, it just goes through the roof. Your efficiency with Breaches goes through the roof massively. Now, the one thing I hated with Breaches was I played Josh Roberts at Goonhammer and he cleverly put his Wraith around the objective. So my Breaches were like, oh, God, I don't get reroll wounds now. But that stratagem to reroll wounds can still do even if they're off the objective. Yeah, he ran so, like just the outside, not touching the objective. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was yeah. just like baiting me. I was like, God damn it, Josh. <laughs> Let me do my breacher thing. But this, this is like breaches on crack. They're amazing. Yep. I love it. Uh, so fantastic. Fireblade, you are uh, a genius. Now, the ethereal is mm. a bit less of a genius, in my opinion. And you might not realize that by looking at the data sheet, because he has some solid enough rules here. So he has failure, which is not an option, which is five of phenopane for the unit he's leading. Five of phenopane on one wound models is not particularly good. Um, if this was a meta, if this was a game where everybody had admec tier damage, you could consider uh, bringing that type of uh, defensive buff. But it's it's not better than getting the damage output of the fire blade, and this is what the ethereal is really competing with. Now, the one rule he does have that is very good is coordinated leadership. In your command phase on a four up, you gain a CP. It's inconsistent. It's not as consistent as some other rules out there, but he's much cheaper than a lot of those characters. Um, and this is one of the ways you can regen CP. If you didn't want to run a Shadow Sun, you can instead run the Ethereal here and uh, try and get extra CP that way. Once again, it really um, emphasizes if you go for that fixed secondary type of plan with Tau, uh, an Ethereal is a decent enough choice, and you can give him a smattering of things, although once again, he doesn't have for the greater good, so he even if you give him a marker drone, he can't... Uh, you know, <laughs> he can't guide things, which is unfortunate. And uh, you can give him the hover drone to make him move 10 inches and have fly. It's all good. But um, I think the real reason you would think about taking him is for the 4-up CP regen, because CP is just power in this book. CP is power. Um, I was, so for me personally, I think he's minimally useful. Yeah. He, it's he, in that specific scenario, you are a fixed player. You're going to go fixed every game. You want the extra CP and you're okay with it being relatively cheap but inconsistent, this is what you would you would run a, a, a Ethereal or two. I'd love to put Ethereals in Rarely Seen, um, just like Gunvar now. I'm, oh, no, sorry, that's non-existent. Sorry, Richard. That's non-existent. That's sad. <laughs> it's very sad. Sorry, you can, you can mock me back at some point by just mentioning Long Strike. It's all right. <laughs> when we get to the Hammerhead. <laughs> Where's that Hammerhead <laughs> character that you like? <laughs> Where is he? Oh, oh. All right. <laughs> Okay, it's just a bit of shade thrown each other. I love it. But Ethereals, I agree. I think um, it it kind of pained me that they just kept it on a 4+. plus. I mean, there's lots of armies out there that just have free CP, like the Wayleaper or Leontis and things like that. I know they're obviously priced accordingly, but it just, if it was like a, th even if it was like a 2+, plus or a 3+, plus, I'd be like, yeah, cool, all right. Maybe it goes up a tier. And if it was automatic, I'd say it would suddenly go into solid choice or even a tournament staple, depending on if you're taking Farsight. But because of it set of 50-50, that's why it's minimally useful. That's a great point. You mentioned Farsight. You cannot take Farsight and any Ethereals. So yeah. Farsight being so good means the Ethereal himself is less valued as well. Um, yeah. And that that's unfortunate because, like you said, even if it was, it, if it went off on a 3-up, I think he would definitely be situational and seen mm. like about half the time or a little bit less than that. 
And then if it was a two up, I think it would just be a solid choice and you'd see it in exactly. a lot of non Farsight lists. But um, yeah. because Farsight's so good, that's another downside of minimally useful. And honestly, like you mentioned Anva, because Farsight's so good, I don't feel as bad about Anva not being here because now I don't have the tough choice of do I take Anva or Farsight. Now I, yeah. I just take Farsight and I love Farsight. I mean, it's good that you've gone back to your roots, my friend, you know, know. because you are Commander Farsight, right? So oh, why are you messing around with your ethereals? You, 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 you bought into the propaganda and now you're back, man. I'm back. Like, Commander Farsight, let's go. I'm back, I got my red <laughs> armor on again. All right, we got yeah. Mr. Dark Strider. I think you and I are both on the same train, so I'm just going to put him in Tournament Staple. I think he is one of the first oh. things I put in every single list. And there's a wide variety of things. I'll let you explain the deployment tricks that you can do with him. But um, in terms of one of the main reasons that I really prize him is a 12 inch no-go zone. There's a bunch of armies in the game that have 3.1 away. And Tau now have it with Retaliation Contra. <laughs> and you don't want anything in your backfield. If your opponent takes tactical, there's a lot of secondaries available back there that if you can screen it out the whole game, your opponent is going to score a much less, um, you know, they'll score like maybe less than 35, maybe even around 30 secondary points instead of a potential 40 if they can access your backfield. Uh, so Hypercrypt is out there. You got GSC, Grey Knights, you got the Retaliation Cadre, um, and the Chaos Demons, a bunch of other armies have it. And blocking a particular area of the board is super good. Space Marines with their Inceptors are a big problem for Tau. Being able to create a safety zone for some of your key units is uh, critical in my opinion. If he joins a Pathfinder squad, which I have done in the past, not often, usually he's solo, but if I do join him, um, and you, you might think about doing it in Monka, because you get plus one to wound, you can give them reroll wounds out of a transport against the closest eligible, and you can give them plus one AP alongside a Breacher squad, and with all the, the you know nine cyclic shots and the variety of weapons they have, it's actually still a quite decent amount of firepower. Um, so I think there, there's a decent amount of play there, uh, especially into like Catan, getting reroll wounds against them and the plus one to wound, you actually put on quite a bit of damage into them as well. So uh, go ahead and explain uh, the Kyle Grundy maneuver. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> basically, like you've mentioned every decent point about Dark Strider, but the one thing that I love him for, both in the lore and on the game, is his tactical acumen, his way of pulling off tricks that nobody else can and somehow getting away with it and surviving in the law. Um, in game, he doesn't usually survive all the time, <laughs> but most of the time he stays alive. Now, infiltration and scout is such an important uh, phase of the game, and it's like a game within a game. Mm -hmm. And you can often lose or win the battle based off your positioning alone. So with Dark Strider having the scout uh, keyword and infiltrate, and then the Pathfinders also potentially having the infiltrate if you give them the recon drone and the scout move, you can assert your dominance on the battlefield by placing your pathfinders in a position where they are blocking out enemy infiltrators and are in an aggressive push. And it's going to be more important with um, Montcar now and the retaliation cadre being able to get your spotting units into position, but then you don't want to be losing an important piece. Um, so what can you do to get around that? So the idea is you put Dark Strider and a Devilfish on his own, you scout move that forward, and then your Pathfinders have been positioned in such a way that when you do your scout move backwards, you're now wholly within three of the Devilfish so that you can then embark into the Devilfish in the scouting phase because it's a normal move, so therefore you're still eligible to embark in a vehicle. So you've forward deployed aggressively, and if you're not going first, you can a retreat so there's lots of little tricks that you can do now with Pathfinders, Devilfishes, Scout moves, and you can get your kind of stuff out of your deployment zone. And I think Tau are going to, in certain builds, especially your Montcar build that you're saying about the Breacher Fish, you might start to find that with your Riptides and your Breacher Fish, you might be running out of space. So how are you getting your units out of your deployment zone? And Pathfinders and Devilfish can definitely be a great way of doing that. So Dark Strider for me is just the tip of the iceberg for those little maneuvers that you can do. You can go and check it out on my uh, YouTube. I've got two or three videos based around it. So if you want more information, go and check it out. But honestly, Dark Strider, tournament staple. And he always will be <laughs> for that 12-inch rule for me. I'm always going to keep him in. Now, you might say, so he doesn't have a loan op. And so if you use him solo against indirect fire, he can die. 
but that's where having a Pathfinder unit, you can join him. There are a bunch of ablative wounds to keep his ability alive, or you can use a Devilfish to hide him for certain turns when you really yes. uh, need to protect him. So it's not the end of the world. It would have been nice if he got loan op, but uh, Tau <laughs> have more loan ops than, than most people. And if someone's shooting a Manticore at Dark Strider, then fair enough. Fair enough, we'll, we'll take it. He's probably dead, but it'd be hilarious if he lives. <laughs> All so, right, next what, up we got the Strike next. Teams. Okay. So... I let's just state that they have gotten a lot better. Um, I think their <laughs> rule that they have got is it suppression fire, suppression volley. Yep. So effectively, if you shoot an enemy un infantry unit and you hit, they have to subtract one from their hit rolls. So pretty good, right? Um, they still got decent range. I think the pulse rifle is still thirty inch range. Shame about the AP, but if you start to look at some of the synergies within uh, stratagems then you can get it up to AP1. So I think, personally, uh, they are going to still be situational. I wouldn't say they are, like, minimally useful, because being able to apply a minus one to a unit just for doing your thing, and they're still a decent spotting unit because they've got a marker like. So I think they're situational at the moment. I can't see them being a solid choice because breaches are king and they still are far better and punch up against strike teams but strike teams in combination with other stuff um can really kind of add another tool in the toolbox if you will yeah unfortunately it only works against infantry units so my yeah. biggest problem with this rule is that enemy infantry units are either out in the open screening on an objective whatever and they're expecting to die or they're behind terrain in a transport whatever somewhere you can't interact with them with this ability and obviously you can take the um, the little support turret, but <laughs> then it'll be minus one to hit, and then you know you have no consistency of actually hitting uh, your thing. So uh, I personally think that they're minimally useful uh, because even though this ability works in shooting in combat, and that's why it's actually pretty decent, in practice, there's very few armies that are going to stand their infantry unit out there and be like, I'll take the minus one to hit and minus one, you know, minus one to hit, and this will be impactful to me because I'll still have a bunch of models. It's like very few armies can just stand out there out in the open against Tau. Um, so I, I just don't think it has a role because the Breacher actually does damage and this unit barely does any and really requires you to use two CP to try and do a minimal amount of damage. Um, if they got, I think they, they just have to get significantly cheaper. They need to be the, I'm going to trade bodies type of unit. And if they do anything else, it's cool. I think that's the type of unit they need to be. They need to, they need to be a bit more expensive than croup, but not by much, is my opinion. They're just way They're too good cool. against orcs. <laughs> I mean, orcs, right, shoot creatures. them at range and make a minus one tip, make them hit on sixes. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, like the infantry is in truck, the orc infantry is in the trucks, they're in the battle wagons. You don't get to hit them until they're out, and then when they're out, if you don't have the firepower to kill them, you're probably losing the game dramatically anyway, mm. is my opinion. How do you feel about that? that yeah, I think it's fair. I mean, I think there's probably going to be some builds in the future when we play test more. Um, that, or, or what I like to say is that maybe they will have a place when the meta starts shifting. Um, so, yeah, I agree. We'll put, let's put them into minimally useful. Sorry, Strike Teams. You, you're so cool and iconic, but uh, at least 4-Up Overwatch was entirely useless. Uh, <laughs> this actually has some sort of uh, <laughs> interesting thing to it. Okay, Breacher Teams, already talked about them a bunch of times. Uh, they're straight-up automatic, in my opinion. Um, the Retaliation Codger is the only one where you might not take many of them, or even any of them, because they don't get any buffs from that detachment whatsoever. Pretty much any other detachment, you're taking multiple units. I think Moncock will easily take three, two, three. six. Three is like the minimum you would take there, and then you could go all the way up to six if you wanted to. And their rule is they reroll wounds against enemies on objectives, which is very strong, because strength six, there's not too many things that are T12+, plus, and uh, you have other guns that are, are better into that stuff. But against even Catan standing on an objective, you can do a lot of damage to them uh, pretty quickly with these units. The Fireblade helps enhance their damage, and then they have Assault natively, and they have a BS3 weapon natively, so they go to um, hitting on twos uh, quite easily with uh, being guided, and then Assault means you never have to really, uh, like in the later turns of Monka, you'll still have Assault on them, and that's infinitely useful. And then obviously with aggressive mobility, flat six advance on them, you're like, cool. Disembark from my transport, move 12 inches, you can pull off all sorts of move blocks and wraps and traps and all, you know, 
tons of damage where your opponent doesn't expect it. I think this unit is amazing, and it's my personal favorite unit to, to run in this edition. Two OC. Yeah, I agree. Agreed. And uh, I, I like, I kind of like and maybe dislike a little bit how the combat embarkation has now moved to just Kion, um, whereas the combat debarkation has gone to Monkar. So I kind of smiled to myself thinking, all right, I see what you did there, but oh, I really like doing the shenanigans. You can just hop into a Delphish <sighs> now. I would kill Kion. I would kill to switch out the uh, the two <clears throat> CP minus one to, to hit like strat. Oh, yeah, yeah. Whatever yeah. that garbage strat is, yeah, Pulse Onslaught. If I could swap oh, that oh, out oh. for Combat Embarkation or Photon Grenades, oh, yeah. would love it. I know, I know. But I think now we've just got to get in that mindset of like, no, stop it. You're now in Monk Car. None of this, you know, running away. Just go in, Kill be them. aggressive, get the job done. Yeah. <laughs> Kill them or, or force them to play so defensive that you're way ahead on points. Um, absolutely yeah. so i agree with the you know three units um i'd say depending on list and obviously some people might not have it but i think you could get away with two but you really want three in, in monka absolutely yeah i haven't written any monka list with less than three of them for sure yeah. so good all right uh moving on to the crisis battle suits so which crisis suit unit would you like to talk about first uh i am i favor the sunforge personally I know you're a fan oh. of the other two. If you want to, I'll do Sunforge and you can do the I other will two. go with the Fire Knife and then you can do the Sunforge. Okay. Go ahead. So and you can do the Fire Knife first. Fire Knife. Okay. So um, a couple of things happened um, that I was a little bit like, huh? So Plasma Rifles going down to 18 inches was a little bit okay. Why? I mean, maybe in 11th edition, we go down to 12 then, and then 12th edition, we go down to 6. Like, what? why reduce 6-inch range for plasma rifles? But then when I, <laughs> when I looked a bit further, I was thinking, okay, let's think about this. So I'm movement 10, and I've now got 18, so that's 28. So most of the time, I'm going to be battling out for mid-board anyway, so the extra range is not really going to... Uh, the loss of range is not really going to kind of affect me. And then there's obviously the assault and auto advancing with stuff that you can do in the Monk card attachment. So again, not really going to affect me. But then I thought, well, I do really want something with long range though. And missile pods, I know from the previous edition, we went from 36 down to 30, but now they've at least kept it at 30. So having that 13th range with your movement 10 and potentially more if you're advancing and teleporting and stuff, I really like um so for me i've been looking at my fire knife combinations to be missile pods so i would put the fire knife into tournament staple one unit if you take one unit it's definitely tournament staple and you can play around with different combinations but personally i've been favoring the sunforge and the two fire knife teams and uh is that in retaliation cadre yes so retaliation cadre has got two of them in and okay. then one of them is with the Enforcer, with these uh, Star Flare things, and they're going to up and downsies. And then the other one can deep strike in, so you can really like crush a flank all together. So, um, and... Yeah, the thing about Retaliation Cadre is you already want to play somewhat aggressive. So the loss of the 6-inch range really hurts hitting somebody in their deployment zone or, or such, mm. um, or from like the you know, edge of midfield to their deployment line. But... If you are actually trying to get the benefit, which I genuinely think you will try with missile pods for sure, because it's such a big breakpoint uh, into a lot of things, mm. then getting access to the extra AP, you're going to get aggressive with them at some point. And the extra strength as well. Yeah, because strength, strength AP is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so strength A, AP2, two, 2 damage. Um, so I think the more shots is what we're going with here, hence why your missile pods... People have joked and said it's like a poor man's cyclic, but... Yeah, but you've got range and you don't blow yourself up. <laughs> so, yeah. happy day yeah. for me. The people who complain about Cyclic, the, the issue with Cyclic, as strong as it was for killing stuff, is the fact that you would blow up half of your unit on average yeah. uh, when you ran the big six-man. And even with a three-man, you were killing you know close to a model each time you activated because you were almost always overcharging. And it meant that you bled your own bring it down points, and when you finally got to Cao Yun, you would not have much of a unit left. <laughs> mm. And so you would still get good advantage from it, like because the commander was alive. But you you kind of have to murder yourself over the first couple turns to slow your opponent down and kill what you can. So um, I had switched to fusion 
I had ran like a handful of cyclic and mostly fusion because of that exact same reason is I didn't want to blow up my own unit. I needed it alive turns three, four, uh, five. So. Yeah, because you were experimenting with different stuff as well. I think I was doing the same, but I was actually experimenting with like three man crisis suits, and I thought the Kaon unit was great. But what if I just switched to the Kaon unit being all missiles to go and delete things like scout units, infiltrating units, small little chaff pieces, and trading pieces? Because that's all I'm getting out of my Kaon unit in the first couple of turns. And then, oh, look, look what's happened. Our crisis teams are now in three months so it's kind of really nice to see that some level of thought that was put in beforehand just to test stuff and practice stuff has actually come into play now with our codex and it's no longer big bricks of six but um just to not get off topic the fire knife um i actually really like the gun drones in the unit so you've suddenly got gun drones that can have full rerolls to hit and with them being twin linked full rerolls to wound as well and if, you, if you're in that six inch range for the retaliation cadre and extra AP, and if you're in Monkai, you can give extra, um, Monkai is actually can give extra AP as well. So suddenly gun drones become quite tasty. And if you had two gun drones on an enforcer, and then one each and one shield drone with a crisis suit, that's 10 shots with full rerolls to hit and potentially full, well, full rerolls to wound and potentially full rerolls to hit. Yeah, uh, which is exactly where you want to be. I mean, there's hardly any units that are, are that efficient for that many points. And then, like we talked about, the Enforcer is the key to this unit because yeah. you need to keep it alive for, or at least to force your opponent to dedicate some real serious firepower to it, which lets other things survive. Yeah, but Richard, some people might say the Fire Knife, though, yeah, it's all good, you know, with four euros tip, but what if someone's got stealth and someone makes mana set? Don't care. I've got the um, basically ignore all and any modifiers. It's the hit roll. Yeah, unfortunately, so, I wish it was ballistic skill modifiers too, because then you could split fire efficiently. Split fire, but, right? Uh, only the hit. But, but that's a really good point you made because you don't necessarily have to spot for this unit. Because if you are targeting things at full strength, you yep. could just hit on fours and reroll everything. Yep. Which so is basically, is as efficient uh, as splitting, hmm. like having half a unit go one way, half of a unit go other way, you'll probably do about the same, frankly. About the same. A little bit worse um, on one, a little bit better on the other. I think it matters for the commander in the unit because you could put all the crashes into one target and the commander into the other. That's that's where it mattered a lot for previously with Kalyan, was you'd mm. almost always split the commander's cyclic off and him and Kalyan would do enough damage to like something by himself, even with the minus one. But even now, it's not the end of the world. You can still split the commander off. Um, especially yeah. if it gets full rerolls. Yeah, so I think uh, I'm, I think I can see what you're doing with the uh, other detachments and putting the other one. You might as well go straight into the Sunforge one and tell us why you've put it at tournament staple. Yep. So Sunforge. Now Sunforge, you, you, I'm the person who was running Fusion probably more than anybody, and I really liked having access to the super high AP. There are a couple of units in the game that can be tricky for Tau, like a Land Raider Redeemer in Black Templar's Gladius or Ultramarine's Gladius. You know, any of these various builds where a two-up save in cover, which doesn't really matter for Tau, but Armor of Contempt can all of a sudden, you know, with T12, just not die and then you get hit by some sort of aggressive crazy unit that comes out of it. Um, and there's a handful of other units that are pretty annoying to deal with uh, for Tau, which is relatively medium AP. But these units in particular, like Redemptors previously have been a problem because they also have minus one damage, along with their uh, two-up save and potential armor of contempt. So there was a handful of units that I really wanted super high AP multi-damage against, and that I really felt comfortable going into Catan with Breachers and Fusion when I got up close with that Fusion unit. <clears throat> Anyway, the why I like this unit is because six-man fusion was like a nutty amount of damage. It was like, okay, your land raider failed like six saves and took 37 damage. You know, you're just out of here. The amount of times that I just easily blew something up um, was almost every time. <laughs> now, did I need that amount of firepower? No, but I, I couldn't. Three-man wasn't consistent enough without any extra buffs um, as just like an... You know, if you took your normal Kalyan buffs with a three-man in your commander, that wasn't always guaranteed to do it. You needed, like, four-plus to make sure that it happened. And now you can access reroll wounds and damage against monsters and vehicles in a three-man. That point, it becomes very, very efficient. I literally just played into the Land Raider, and the commander plus a suit just blew up 
uh, most of it by itself. So, <laughs> and then like a three man will actually just almost always kill it, especially in retaliation contra. <clears throat> so really, really love this unit because Tau can struggle against monster vehicle threat overload type lists. So like Chaos Knights was one of the armies that Tau um, yep. in general struggled against or orcs with all their trucks and buggies and, and stuff. Having these units get full rerolls from Tetras, these units love Tetras, and then the reroll wounds and damage against those monsters and vehicles means you can very easily pick up, you know, th if you run three of these units, pick up three in a turn. Um, and that's extremely powerful. And in addition, they have that native shield generator. So you go to five wounds with the shield drone, then you have the native four up invuln, and they just tank damage. They, they four up invuln on these guys, still, it's, even though they don't have six wounds, it's still very awkward for a lot of things to get through it efficiently. Um, and I, I literally was tanking like the Bolter Discipline Eradicator unit <laughs> somehow. Uh, I did roll a lot of four ups though. <clears throat> But needless Austin. to say, this unit is amazing. I think Farsight goes in here perfectly, and as we mentioned, the Cold Star also supports it perfectly. Um, so regardless, I, I love this unit. Uh, you don't have to run it. I think there are other options, but if you want a really good anti-tank piece, that's a lot more consistent than Riptides. Riptides are consistent because they shoot for multiple turns, but they're wildly inconsistent as like a single piece. The Sunforge unit is wildly consistent as a single piece. And so it's like the opposite Riptide. It's like, if I really need to kill something, I've got the Sunforge. If I need to chip things down and just be alive, I've got my Riptides in the backfield. Great. Good explanation of them. And I think you're going to use, um, you're going to use them as like little um, insert, insertion like pieces, like uh, precision knives, and just go, right, cool, I need that dead die. And like you, I've had to get out of um, the old habit of best just to never split fire, and then your crisis suits go, Commander, what are you doing? We've already sorted it. And you're like, oh. Oh, actually, you're quite powerful now, yeah. Okay, yeah. I've just wasted my commander who's not even shot. <laughs> I, I, think, um, I think that's the great thing that you bring up there, is that three-man crisis units actually feel valuable now. They yes. feel valuable. And before, three-mans were super inconsistent and really didn't do much. Um, they were just a support piece to help finish chip things off. Now, a fully functional three-man is, is a really good piece by itself. And that three inch in retaliation cadre is going to be very popular at start. People are going to obviously bank into that. And then maybe the meta wises up and takes more, you know, deep strike denial units and things like that. But even then, in Monkar, you can still have a unit like um, just rapid ingress maybe with the stealth suits for free and then have a cold star and just move auto advance with the stratagem in 18 and then go melt stuff. So it's still going to be scary for your opponent to deal with. So having at least one of these in every list and then probably more depending on how else you've teched your list to deal with anti-tank, Chaos Knights, Land Raiders and stuff like that, these guys don't care. They'll just go in, especially with Farsight you mentioned, with the plus one to wound. Hell yeah. Heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what's next? The Star Scythe. The Star Scythe, yep. Um, okay, so I know a lot of people are excited about this because it's like a chance to bring back burst cannons and flamers. Um, but the way that I look at the meta um, evolving currently, there's not a lot of horde armies out there. So I'm not knocking their ability. The ability is very good because you get the extra AP if you're, as long as you're not targeting monsters and vehicles. And you could also uh, fall back and shoot. So that could be very good for doing secondaries and very good for um, blocking and shooting and then falling back and doing lots of things, especially with flamers for Overwatch as well. So I think they have a very good tech role, but not necessarily needed for the damaging infantry units. Because you mentioned before, a lot of infantry units will be hiding, staging, um, doing secondaries and just sitting behind walls and stuff, holding objectives. So, And if they're blocking you out, then you can't really deep strike to get the angles. So you're going to struggle. Whereas other units can just straight up go and do damage. Um, so I would probably put them... It's hard to put them anything lower than solid choice, right? But for me... yeah. I'm not going to the star side straight away. I, I think you hit the nail on the head, is that the meta right now is very elite infantry and vehicle slash monster heavy. Um, or it has, you know, like weird things like wraiths that are just like yeah. durable beasts. Um, and so the ability on this is very good. The problem is, is that the basic burst cannon and flamer, even though you can boost them, whether in Monka with the extra AP or whether in retaliation with plus one strength, plus one AP, and then they give the additional AP, 
that is awesome, except that you're still very low strength. Um, and there's no reroll wounds here. Reroll wounds would have been able to compete with breachers. I think breachers fill the anti infantry role supremely well for cheaper. And they also do the out seeing that you want. And so, even though like Farsight in a unit of six flamers, or take the uh, commander with the flamers plus the unit of flamers, that unit does very good work in your opponent's backfield. Low's 3.1 away, it'll clear that. But it doesn't do so for re for very cheap. It takes two CP plus also the um, you know the points of a commander and the unit, which is not cheap at the moment. So I think because of that, it's just you're not really ever efficiently trading this unit. Whereas you can get much more efficient trades than some of the other ones. Um, and like you said, the data sheet rule is very good, but it's not so good and so unique in this army that. It, it's uh, it's going to be something that you see in all the lists because I keep trying to want to run this unit like twenty four. You sound like twenty four burst cannon shots at strength six, AP two, one damage. It sounds good, but then you look at you know two breacher squads and you're like, well, I'll probably just take the two breacher squads, frankly. Um, so that that's how I feel about them. I think yeah, and I'm and I'm prepared to eat my words on this one as well because I reckon what I can see, but I just can't quite see it. Yet, it's like there's a mist in the crystal ball. Is that I reckon there's going to be a really clever combo. Um, and I was thinking like you know if you put Farsight in there for plus one to wound, it's in the Kion and it's got a stratagem that could be plus one to wound, so you could have plus two. So if anything's got minus one, and then you've also got potentially ways of increasing their AP. And like how could it be applied in sneaky ways to deal with like I don't know Hearthguard or something with you know there's all that kind of stuff, but it's all these li little investment pieces to make it work rather than just insert Sunforge or insert the Fire Knife. So I think there's somebody somewhere is going to create a really powerful combo that will just work to the meta but the overall meta right now is not screaming out horde deal with horde it's like anti you know it's elite and vehicles so now wait to see on mm. the other hand if crude palooza happens and crude gets some <laughs> excellent points then you just if you're the tau player you run three star scythe kittens and you pick up an insane amount of bodies every turn <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. You know I'm going to go crude, crude palooza, and you're like, I'll just take star side. I'll and I'm like, stop it. Damn it, Richard. Star <laughs> <laughs> Let me run angry chickens. Uh... Let me do it, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, otherwise, I like. I feel good about the data. It has a good data sheet rule. If it gets quite a bit cheaper in points, if we're talking maybe like a 35 points per model type of area, yeah. you know, then, uh, then I start getting quite interested. Uh, but right now, I think it just does. It trades down. It kills infantry, but it trades down doing so because it's not. It's not that cheap. Yeah. All right. Uh, moving on to the next one. So stealth suits. They got a sweet detachment upgrade or a data sheet upgrade, which is their observer benefit is not only reroll ones to wound now. It's also reroll ones to hit, which gives Tau even more ways to reroll hit rolls. And on top of that, there's still a very good infiltrator unit in the Cadre. They can gain access to the plus one strength and plus one AP, which makes them do a solid amount of damage. And um, they can always, uh, with that uh, battlesuit support system, fall back in action or shoot if you really wanted to with that model. And then that free rapid ingress is not something to be undervalued, especially if you're running Sunforge. You really want to be rapid ingressing at some point and being able to do it for free really opens up CP on other stuff, which I think is fantastic. So I think every list should have at least one of these units, frankly. I think one is just bare, is you just always run one. And then from yeah. there you can decide on if you want to run more. Because it's just a good action piece it is, too. It is an action piece. It is sad that we can't do the three inch deep strike with rapid ingress for retaliation cadre. Yeah. Um, otherwise that would be like, all right, stealth suits galore <laughs> everywhere. Um, but I am actually looking at potentially going from three man stealth suits to six mans because in the retaliation cadre with the plus one AP and strength, not too bad, you know, and you can take two fusions in that unit as well. So not too shabby. Uh, it depends on the points, and if they stay the same points, then 60 points for three stealth suits, great utility piece, 120 for quite a damage dealer as well. Not bad. No, I think this unit is super good. Do you think it's tournament staple or just solid in every list? I think, oh, ooh. I'd say, you know, I'm going to go with the conviction tournament staple because you'll need at least one. Yeah, I think one is, is just perfectly reasonable for everything. 
And because they give the reroll ones to hit, there are some units like a Riptide that actually likes the reroll ones to hit once to wound over, say, just full rerolls. Um, yeah, or to, to in, proc the dev works better, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And also in um, Monka, you have the pinpoint uh, offensive stratagem to get full rerolls when your opponent kills your units. So <laughs> the, la the latter you get into the game, it's actually better to potentially have uh, the reroll ones to wound um, rather than full rerolls, which you're already kind of redundant on. Which is a nice thing to say. <laughs> mm. Being redundant on full rerolls is, is a good place to be. Okay, next up, Ghost Kill. Ghost Kill. So, didn't change. Um, it's still an absolute beast. Um, annoying beast, shall we say. Um, two blanks still. Lone Operative. The guns have remained the same. I think the Ghost Kill is solid choice overall. Mm hmm and obviously, even if it kind of sticks around the same 160, maybe it goes up a little bit because it is ludicrous for 160 points. Um, if even if it goes from between 160 and 180, it's still a solid choice. I think you're gonna um, take th potentially three of these in the Cam Detachment um, because your Wall of Mirrors is effectively your stratagem that you're gonna be constantly doing and just teleporting and being annoying. Maybe one Ghost Kills down to a couple of wounds after tanking a load, and then it wants to bugger off. And then you can just take it somewhere else across the board and do secondaries. So I think the secondary game for ghost kills has always been strong in the way that we use them. Just having a solid piece to take damage and fall back, shoot, do actions. Um, and I think in Kion, you're going to see more of them. In every other list, I think you're going to be spoilt for choice. And you might have to make some tactical picks whether you're taking one or none. And you're favouring Riptides, for example, in the Retaliation Cadre. Um, but I can definitely see lists still taking one. And um, that's why I would put them in solid choice, because there's nothing bad about them. And then in Retaliation Cadre, you can bump up the strength of that Fusion Collider to 13, and then suddenly it's wounding things like, like I think, the Land Raider and the Monolith. I think the Monolith is T13, right? Or... Yeah, it lost the toughness in the Codex. Yeah, so basically you can win that on fours. Um, the AP, making the Cyclic Iron Raker, AP3 when you overcharge, suddenly that's tasty. So... I think it's solid. What, 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 what would, where would you put it? I completely agree that it's solid choice. And I think your analysis on Kalyan is that stratagem really does help stealth suits, uh, the Ghost Keel, and then Shadow Sun to a lesser extent. It's a very good stratagem. Um, and it really helps that mobility and being able to redeploy to sides of the board, especially in the late game. when Late game. Big parts yeah. of the board open up. And Kalyan is usually at a points deficit. They need to be able to get into all sorts of interesting areas, and that strat really helps. So I think that is the best attachment. That's where I would definitely run at least one, if not more. Um, I've tried running them in, like, in Retaliation Contra, they're fine. I don't think they gain as quite as much as Riptides. And mm. you start or the Crisis units, and that's why I, I, I struggle to add them in there. I kind of prefer the Crisis units or maxing my Riptides first before adding Ghost Kills. They're kind of the yeah. third suit unit that I start adding in. Uh, and then for Monka, I think they're, they don't really fit at all with Monka. And the reason is, is because Monka, uh, you know, one of the Tau's biggest issues is if you're not killing your opponent at a relatively good pace, the game is super tight. And you need some way to create a better differential. And usually that's through denying your opponent primary. And Monka is all about that philosophy. And with that, you can spend, you know, you got your 90-point Breacher unit and your 75-point Devilfish, 165. It's only five points more expensive. Now, obviously, these points can change. But they're both basically around the same. So you can get a Ghost Kill or you can get those two units. And I typically favor the ability to do the primary damage to my opponent, denying them points over surviving on an objective, which I think Tau can do through redundancy and tricky movement and positioning. So I definitely lean towards um, it being just a solid choice. You don't feel bad about running it, but I think it competes um, slightly unfavorably with uh, the board control elements of Tau. Uh, that's my opinion. Yeah, and um, one thing to add with the Ghost Kills is that they are currently um, um... A safety net or people are rushing to them with indirect being so powerful with guard and i don't disagree with that choice and i think ghost kills are always solid but i don't think you need them and i think when you look at the aggression that we've now got in forms of stratagems and different combinations then you could just go full send and we're way more aggressive than we used to be so solid choice ghosty yeah you're still one of my favorite models you're awesome and you're still good 
he's still good. He's just completely solid. Nothing wrong with him. All right, moving on to the Pathfinder team. So Pathfinders, we already mentioned a couple of their synergies with Mr. Darkstrider. And uh, the Recon Drone is, uh, I think, the auto pick here because it allows you to get Infiltrate. And Infiltrator Scout is just ludicrously powerful. I'm going to swap over here um, as I expand the tournament staple area, which is, wow, it's getting full. <laughs> it's getting full. <laughs> so a little bit more space to fit those Pathfinders in, and I'll keep adjusting it to fit more and more stuff in as we add things up there. But um, Pathfinders, what a great unit. Being able to uh, natively scout your Devilfish if you're inside is fantastic, mm -hmm. but also blocking your opponent's Infiltrators and then being able to scout uh, like behind a train piece or into a Devilfish uh, with Dark Strider inside is just ludicrously strong. And this is one of the best early aggressive move block pieces that Tau can offer against a, an opponent that wants to get aggressive. Um, so I, I think they're, like in, in Kalyan, you have to run these guys to slow your opponent down. In Retaliation Kadra, they don't get any benefit from the detachment, but still, um, and you also want your opponent to kind of get close to you, but they can still help in a variety of areas. And they also, they um, with their uh, Observer ability, can pick two different can guide two different units and switch the target between those guides, which is is uh, certainly not uh, without uh, merit. Um, and then finally, they have a decent amount of damage output with three cyclic uh, ion rifles in there and a smattering of shots. It's just a super solid unit, and I think actually when they finally went down, like the original codex points uh, or index points for these guys were this, they were like 120. They were like same as breachers. When they both went down to 90, they both were competitive with each other. Yeah. And I think it and remains that, that way. A constant, it's a constant battle in my head sometimes. I was like, oh, well, I could put a fourth breach team or I could just have another Pathfinder team. And I most of the time went to another Pathfinder team just for that ability to spot twice. And now I think that spotting twice has become even more needed on top of the fact that they also get the bonus in Kion of like the sustained when against the, the spotted unit. Yep. So... That's cool. And with the irons, and you can increase their BS as well with coordinate to engage. Yeah, as you so, mentioned here, the MSU nature of modern Tau lists is going to demand more observers, and being yeah. able to do it twice um, is, is a big benefit. Um, and it, if you go heavy on Pathfinders, it's not bad to have Shadows on there to give the reroll ones to hit. Um, or if mm -hmm. you're in Monka, you can get the full rerolls if they start killing other stuff first. All it takes is one Pathfinder to survive and you to pass your Battle Shock to still be able to do it. Yep. Still good. Uh, so I, I think they're absolutely a tournament staple. One is like the bare minimum for me. One is bare minimum. I'm usually going with two units. Um, but again, it all depends on the attachment. All right. So next up speaking is the of Fire Sight. Yeah. Fire Sight Marksman. Um, I'm just going to not waste any time. He's a character, a lone op. Okay, cool. But for me, I'd say I can't really see the use of him because I don't want to give away too many on assassinate as well so I'd probably put it as personally and minimally useful yeah you would think like relatively cheap loan op character with marker light can be a good guide he'd be pretty decent the problem mm -hmm. is is that he doesn't offer his 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 rule is while the unit is guided he gets full rerolls and they target the spot it's like if that was just the reverse <laughs> then... be, it'd be a solid choice yeah, I would honestly take these over Tetras uh, in certain yeah, situations. Um, and they don't give away bring it down then. Exactly. So I think it's just a, the detach, the data sheet rule is just a complete miss. And because mm -hmm. Tau have lone ops or better observers elsewhere, it's usually better just to get the, the other observers is what I found. And so I think you can run them and not feel super bad about it. I also think that Monka and Kalyan have two um, enhancements that both require the character to be leading a unit. If it didn't require leading a unit, you might actually see this guy as a potential um, holder for those, um, those enhancements. So I, I think it's just a big miss all around, personally. Yeah. But you, you're, it's not, if you run him, you're not actively hurting your army to like an extreme degree, like rarely seen will be. Mm. He's very close, though, to rarely going to be rarely seen, though. I will be honest. <laughs> yeah, but I, I have actually seen him in various lists, and I think if you're like a casual player going to an RTT, going to a smaller GT, if you throw one into your lists, it's not going to be catastrophic or anything like that. It's okay. That's good. 
Um, Vespid, why wasn't their data sheet changed? But you can you can take Vespid. I just wanted to make that a big point. <laughs> um, look, the speedy little bugs that fly around and go up and down in the sky, but then you have to do it in your own turn, not the end of your opponent's turn. So good for blocking rapid ingress. Yep, that's that's the only thing you can say about it. Is this is the best rapid ingress denial tool, and I don't think Games Workshop intended it to be that. <laughs> I think this is just should be edited. No. I think it should I'd get an FAQ update. Situational, to be fair, because rapid ingress is still a big threat. Um, so situational, and it's another. I've seen a couple of really good tau lists. Um, one that um came fourth or fifth at the super major down at the South Coast in the UK had just three units of SBID and it was just broadside for days. Um, and you're just obviously clearly using the three units of SBID just for secondary. So I can see it. Um, but if you're going against any decent indirect, they just get removed, um, and then you cry. Um, so I would put them in situational. Yeah, in I don't think they're going to be minimally useful because there is a use for them. Um, so it's situational. But if they had the rule that everyone else had, they would be a solid choice. Yeah, I agree with that for sure. Now, the one thing here is so Kalyan now has the strat to bring Stealth Suits, Ghost Heal, Shadow Sun back into reserve. And a big part of using them is being able to, if you go for uh, tactical cards, is scoring stuff in your opponent's deployment zone late game, turns four, turns five, when they start running low on screens. And now you have a strat to do that with a three-man stealth suit unit. So Kalyan, I think we'll certainly see less of these, if any of them. Then you have Retaliation Kadra. You got Starflare Ignition to get back there. Um, you're definitely trying to prioritize keeping that unit alive. Once again, not as relevant. Monka is the one area where you could potentially see them. Now, I haven't put them in my Monka list, but you could. And the reason is, is I feel like I've been saying the strat name wrong all the time, so I'm going to actually just look at it. Pinpoint counteroffensive. Pinpoint yeah. counteroffensive. This one excludes crew units from dying and proccing the full rerolls, <laughs> not Vespid. So we can still use them as true alien auxiliaries and shove them out and let them get killed um, and proc this strat. And... The reason that you might think about doing it is one of the cheap options to proc this strat is piranhas, but then they bleed to bring it down points. Yeah. Um, you can, and you don't really want to trade your stealth suits super early. You want to be able to at least get some value out of them being uh, guided. So because of that, Vespid are actually a pretty decent unit to proc this. They go out there, they're super fast, they can easily touch the objectives uh, turn one, and you can be like, well, do you want to actually kill them or not? Um, now, Piranhas have the benefit of being tougher. They require a, an actual damage dealer to potentially kill, whereas Vespid can die to a stiff breeze. But there are reasons to think about running them in this detachment. Um, but I, I still think I, I absolutely agree. They're completely situational at the moment. What has happened to you, Richard? We get a codex and you're just sacrificing units. Go on. I'm taking Vespid just to get them killed. I, I'm taking all <laughs> sorts of stuff to get them killed. <laughs> I need full rerolls, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dude, man, 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 just okay. give us yeah, come in, join the greater good, we really respect you, go die! <laughs> I'm a Tau traditionalist, okay? <laughs> I use my auxiliaries exactly as they were intended, as meat shields for my true Tau <laughs> units. I gotta protect the yeah. fire cast. Now, I will say that um, I, I did, uh, spoilers, so I did play a game with Monka already uh, for stream, that'll be coming mm. out against, uh, or, or it was against Demons coming out this coming week, and in that game, Nick actually... He was like, okay, well, I got to really get rid of these Tetras because I want full rerolls on some of these combos, like on the, the Farsight Crisis unit. So he's like, all right, I'm going to kill kill the Tetras. So he kills the Tetras, and then I proc the Strat. And I'm like, I got full rerolls, no problem, baby. And he's like, oh, my God. I knew you could do that, and I just tunnel vision to killing Tetras, like uh, old school. I can, <laughs> I've watched you and Nick play a lot. I can just see his expression being like, he's thought about it, maybe yeah. sweated a little bit, really contemplated all the options, worked it out, and then gone. God damn it, Siegs. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. He was like, all right, now that you won't have full rerolls at least, there'll be a little bit less damage on these fusion. I was like, it turns out, uh, no, I'm going to use the strat. <laughs> and he attacked uh, it too. Fate amazing. So, okay. Now, I would love to take the Trail Shaper. Feel free to take the Trail Shaper. If there are any oh. crew you're excited about, feel free to take them. Okay, so Trail Shaper, straight away. I love his ability of the trail finding. So uh, let me just say one thing real quick, just to remind people, we're going to not base their their um, their ranking solely off of the point 
you know, or mostly off the points. We're going to prioritize the rules themselves and assume that at a later date they will get reasonable points because hopefully this will be evergreen for the next several months or hopefully year or so instead of basing them off of the points where I think we would rank them quite low. Yeah. So They're a sorry to interrupt pricey, you, but I just want to remind people. So let's have a look at the rules. Infiltrators, leader, scouts, stealth. So it's important that you note that all the shapers have, um, I think all of them have infiltrators um, to allow them to join the far stalkers. Mm -hmm. So straight away, I'm just going to go straight into it. You want one of these in a far stalker unit and potentially you could take another far stalker unit or another unit crew. And it's got the crew ambush. So it says after both players have deployed their armies and determined who has the first turn, you can redeploy this model's unit and one of the friendly crew unit. So unlike the solid hologram projection unit in Kion, which allows you to redeploy, but you have to do it before knowing who has first turn. Mm -hmm. A little bit frustrating that that's a thing. I think GW need to tighten that up across the board. Um, so this allows you to do it after knowing who's going first. So you could block out enemy infiltrators with your far stalker unit and then react and redeploy them. And I think that is so awesome, and it kind of fits both the law and an application on the tabletop. Now, Farstalkers have got quite a big unit. They're on, like, 28 mils. I know all crew now are going to 28 mils, but you've got the kill broker on 32, and you've got two hounds. So the amount of space that you could block off with that one unit is crazy good. And if you put a character in there now, you've now extended it a little bit further. And you could just go, absolutely not, denied you. Um, your scout moves, let's say if you go second, you can deny them their scout moves, and then you can just pull them to safety and go. See ya. It's, That's so good. So it's basically, if you're pl regardless of if you're playing the crew detachment or not, that is a very valuable thing because effectively that's what the uh, Dark Strider plus uh, Devilfish plus Pathfinder yeah. unit is trying to do. But if these characters get some reasonable points and the far stalkers go back to what they are now which is 70 and not 105 or whatever they are in this book then that is legitimately a strong alternative in my mind dark strat has just brought some friends along and been like yeah cool they can do it too yep <laughs> <laughs> and then the trail finding so have you ever gone against necrons and hated the fact that they've got reactive moves or space walls with reactive moves and then loan up um well let's just Crew Detachment, you could do that because the Crew Detachment have access to a loan op stratagem. So if they're not within six, you can move away and then go, all right, well, I'm also now going to loan op. Yes, it's a normal move up to D6, but most of the time they're not going to get that close and you can move away. And being able to play um, a kind of very tactical game in move blocking, and if someone gets within nine, you can just move the crew the, so many tactical applications with this unit, um, and I absolutely love it. Just for those abilities alone, I'm definitely going to consider squeezing in one Trail Shaper and maybe one Far Stock unit all the time. Maybe not in the Retaliation cadre, but it all depends on how important it is for the points and where they land. So for me, absolutely amazing. Trail Shaper is definitely going to be a solid choice, potentially a tournament staple. Yeah, I agree with the the solid choice, and the reason. Um, that I don't think that this is tournament staple, even though this combo is good and will likely be cheaper than the Dark Strider Devilfish Pathfinder mm -hmm. combo, which gives it a lot of value, is the fact that Kroot don't have for the greater good and are not effective observers. And I yeah. really wish they changed that in this one because they they literally are the observers for the Tau Army, is you know along with some other actual units, but like they I are think literally a few of the there. Have got, uh... Uh, binoculars, right? <laughs> exactly. They're they're the spotters, and they're going out there and, and doing the recon uh, work along with pathfinders and you know piranhas mm. and other stuff. So I wish they made that change, uh, but because they didn't, they're since Tau is a very MSU army in the tenth edition codex, they really want to have as many observers as possible, and spending a decent chunk of points on units that don't do it is a little is going to be a little iffy in my opinion. Um, so that's one of the reasons why I wouldn't put them higher than situation uh, than solid choice. Yeah, and I think there's lots of other things. I'd love to talk crew all day long, but we want to go through the rest of the data sheets and stuff. But there is some really nice combos that you can do with an enhancement 
in the croup where you can give um, the unit plus three moves, so then mm-hmm. suddenly they become movement ten, and then it, it just loads of spicy stuff. And then you could obviously loan up your fast stalkers and give them assault keywords. They're great for actions. So trail shaper good. And to be honest with you, yeah, I know obviously you like your mercenaries to die, so I'll just go through a few of the other <laughs> shapers as well, and we'll get them done in one go. That three-inch um, move though also comes with I think twelve-inch no-go zone. Is straight up automatic, yeah, amazing yeah. enhancement. Automatic, yeah, yeah. If you take the detachment. Um, if you take the detachment, right? Feel free to take as many crude as you want. <laughs> okay, cool. Right, I'll do the Lord's work and talk about our angry turbo chickens. So, crude war shaper, solid choice in in a crude detachment. It's going to be tournament staple, um, war leader. Once per battle round, you can basically use a strat for free, and there's a lot of battle tactic stratagems. Uh, Root of Honor. Oh, you have failed a battle shock test. Nope. Cool. Within 12, once per battle, can make them unbattle shocked, which is really important with one of the stratagems that's 2 CP to bring back a unit of Crute. And obviously, the last thing you want to do is fail a battle shock test, and then the enemy just dumps everything into them, and you can't regen them. So. The Crute Warshaper going in these units, and obviously, depending on the points of the Crute, you'll have three Warshapers going in three different units, access to loads of battle tactics, and just go, cool, right, bringing back a unit. Now, I believe there's a bit of umming and ahhing, and I don't know what your take on this is, Siegler, is if you can actually bring back two units of Crute, because I think in the Guard you can't, um, and I think they'll try and replicate um, that, but you could have, in my opinion, when I'm looking at it, it's like, could you do it for free on one unit, and they die, and then in another unit, so you could have two units of crew regenerate? I frankly think it'll be FAQ'd, probably. Exactly, that's, that's so... what I thought. I'd be like, oh, now you might be able to get away with it, but I think it's going to be FAQ'd, because suddenly having 40 angry chickens just come back every turn, well, it, depending on how many warships it is, is ludicrous, but at right now, I think yeah, you can get away with it. But let's just not focus on that. Yeah, the warship is good. Even tell... one, one time is good. One time is good. One time is good, and, and it's a 2CP stratagem, so having it for free is awesome. So I think the Warshaper, not bad. There's a couple of nice little um, enhancements. One of them could have, like, devastating wounds and precision Yep. Um, with his little hook or whatever it is, his grappling hook, and there's another Shaper somewhere with, like, a little uh, shuriken <laughs> or a glaive. <laughs> I think it's cool. Um, and then you've got the Flesh Shaper, so this guy basically gives them sustain hits one, and then obviously they've moved the um, rule that Crute used to have, which was that if they killed something, they get a five plus feel no pain if they had a shaper, four plus feel no pain if they had a shaper, five plus. Now they've just moved it to if a flesh shaper is within is in the is in the unit, they get six up feel no pain, and then if you kill something, uh, it's a five plus feel no pain. So I do like this because you can whittle down a unit. And then you can just go and send them in and kill, and then suddenly that unit in a crew detachment's got a 5 plus invulnerable save from range, 5 plus feel no pain, and it gets quite obnoxious. The combination that I worked out that's quite nice is that it requires a lot of layering, but if you shot them with a lo- shot a unit with a lone spear rider, you basically give full tetra rerolls to that. And then if you charge them with a unit, say, of hounds or rampages, and then you... W- you've hit them or wounded them, you then basically spend a stratagem to give the crew AP 1. So then with this, you're getting sustained hits 1, and you've got full re-rolls, and then you're going to be hitting on 2s, because if you've lowered them from starting strength, you basically get um, plus 1 to hit, and if they're below half strength, they're plus 1 to wound. So you can have a situation where there's like 53 end up 53 hits, and then something like plus 1 to wound could be like more than a third, two thirds, and so it's ludicrous. Um, and then when you kill, you got a five up feel of pain. But that shaper would have to be in the unit, and crew squads at 20 man can take two shapers, whereas a 10 man can take one. So you can have the battle tactic dude, the war shaper, and a flesh terror just go and flesh tear things up. Yeah. So look, the shapers are definitely good in the crew detachment, but if I'm honestly thinking outside of the crew detachment, I think the trail shaper um, would be the solid choice, as we talked about with the Fast Stalkers, and then I think the Crew Lone Spear is a solid choice as well. Um, probably, actually, I'm going to say, depending on the points, I think people are going to be 
putting it into tournament staple just simply because of the abilities that it has. The built-in fire and fade, so it can make a normal move up to six. And it's advanced scouting, so again, it only affects other crew models, and it's the Tetra rerolls, basically, in short. And then for some god knows unknown reason, it's got a blast javelin, assault, blast, 18-inch range, same range as a plasma rifle, but it's just an angry chicken on a chameleon thing. Strength 10, AP 2, 2 damage, D6 shots. What the hell? I, I don't know where that profile came from. <laughs> to be yeah, what the hell? Like, see that rhino? No problem. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> and the fact that you could have two lone spears, <laughs> and they could basically tetra reroll through one of them. I'm honestly surprised it doesn't have death wounds randomly on there. I might as well, right? <laughs> just, just give it everything. Um, and there's some, and I, I expect this, and I know you'll be of similar mind. I'd expect this to get um, FAQ'd, but you can actually put like enhancements on these. Um, no, so totally I think can. you can put the. Um, I think it's on the plus three move one. You can put on them because the other ones I think are restricted to specific shapers. Yeah, no, can... I think there was a funny one. There was a funny one. Um, do you uh, know the... It's um, the 12-inch no-go zone, one. ignore cover. Wasn't there a scout one where actually it talks about a commander, but then it just you can put it on a, <laughs> a crew lone spear because he's a character but not a shaper? Uh, in Manka, yeah. Tau yeah. Empire model only, Tau Empire model only. So the, yeah. excluding shapers, exemplar of the Manka and coordinate ex exploitation, exclude the yeah. shaper specifically. He's not, he's not a shaper. No, he's not a shaper. So basically, the rest of the uh, Fire Warriors and Breach is like, is there something, does our commander look different to you, or is it just me? <laughs> <laughs> this, this commander's just yelling at them, and it's like, it's not a commander, bro, it's just this guy on a, on a chameleon thing. But yeah, Why he, is this crew? He could hold the, the scout thing, although I doubt yeah. he will be anywhere near as cheap as uh, the Fireblade. Yeah. Because no, he, he has some good rules. For me, I think the Crute Lone Spear is going to be a tournament staple because of its rules, um, and also I think it all depends on the points. Because right now, I think they're showing it as 110 points. Yeah, which is ludicrously high. Yeah, yeah. So if it goes down to, say, I'd say 80, 70, maybe you'll take one, maybe two. Yeah, and I don't know, I don't know how Monka, many points it should be. He can hold Strategic Conqueror, the plus one OC, and you have to be on the battlefield to do it, so he's a he's perfect thing to hold that um, mm. as well. Uh, but I don't know if you'll actually run him because you could do the, like I don't think you need it every turn anyway. So I still probably put it on the Fireblade and get the extra value. But he's at least worth considering. But in the crew detachment, you'll probably take three. Yeah, as long as he doesn't stay at 110 points. Yeah, and I think everyone's gonna at least buy one of them because it's a cool model. Really cool, um, Calamandra. Really... He rides a Calamandra. Yeah, when that got revealed, Richard, I was like, oh. It's an oxyotl, like literally they've combined like oxyotl lizard, yeah, kick ass crew all in one, and they've give it a goddamn Mad Max like kind of javelin thing. I'm like, all right, just take my money already. <laughs> yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, I will absolutely get more of that model. He's my favorite of the crew models by a significant absolutely. margin. Yeah, so yeah, I'd say tournament staple with that one, and then what have we got? Crew carnivores. Um, I've already mentioned a couple of things about the crew carnivores. They've got some new guns, like a Tangle Bomb Launcher, <laughs> meh, Gen 5. Um, no they basically weapons. Given, they've given Crute pirate guns, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Just given them, like, weird-looking pirate guns, and the models look quite nice. Um, but up outside of that, you're taking them for the field craft. Sticky Objectives is awesome, and if they stay at the same points... I would probably say if we're going to get some sort of points adjustment, maybe they follow the same suit as Scouts got, so they go up to like 65 points, which is still reasonable yeah. for a unit of Crout. And the most important thing as well is they've gone up to OC2, so not only have they got Fieldcraft to make objectives sticky, and they've got Scout moves, and they've now got OC2, keeping at 55 points would be insane. So I think in all this, people are going to go um, tournament staple because... You're going to have, like, Retaliation Cadre. Maybe I don't want the Breach Fish, but I still need some OC2 bodies making things sticky whilst my rest of my army pushes. Same with Montcar, having the crew Carnivores sat back, taking the objectives, making them sticky, and then just that's all they're doing whilst the rest of your army gets aggressive. So 
if they go to like 65 points each, then what, for 130 points, you've got two OC2 units um, just doing this sticky objective stuff. And then in the crew, obviously, you're just going to take six units of 20. Done. <laughs> Insert shapers. So not, a little, not bad. They still die to a stiff breeze, but stealth can actually be um, deceptively uh, good on these guys because in cover, you're on a five up, minus one to hit. It takes some decent indirect to remove them, so they're not just going to die straight away to one indirect piece. It would take them a considerable amount to remove them. But yeah, for me, sticky objectives, scout moves, and uh, the just hold, holding backfield and doing secondaries. I threw them up at a, a tournament staple because these guys can fit into any Tau list. They're very good in all the different detachments. Sticky objectives is a fantastic rule that Tau previously didn't have. And... Like Kyle said, if they stay relatively cheap, then I think you see quite a bit of them. At 85 points, though, I don't think uh, <laughs> you'll see too many of them. But um, this, like, they're, they're a great package, and I think Retaliation Codger is absolutely where you don't really get tons of value out of Breacher Devilfish combos, and so you can save the points, instead grab three of these units, and they're mostly your OC control. Exactly. Um... Okay, so Crutox Riders. Now, the model. Let's just talk about the model. It's amazing. <laughs> it looks like a Crutox should have done in the first place, not that yeah. bit of fine cast garbage. <laughs> I, have, I have the older one here, but I have the new yeah, one. Yeah, I know, I see. <laughs> it's horrible, but the new one is gorgeous. Unfortunately, um, they've got some okay rules. Look, they get angry and they shoot you if you're, you've shot a friendly crew infantry unit. It's like a basically a free overwatch, but you just hit normally. Um, and they're pretty angry. They're pretty good. They go on to toughness six. They've got five wounds. Still got t-shirt save. Um, and the close combat, six attacks, AP one, damage two. Look, again, situational. Um, I won't... You could take a single one, and we've done that in the past, taking a single crew tox just to sit in an objective or go in strat reserve to do engage on all fronts or behind enemy lines, and you could also just take hounds for that. So honestly, I think you're still going to see... In crew detachments, it's different. I would put them as um, solid choice because you, you're just going to go full on in. Uh, they have got uh, grenades, I believe, which yeah, is good. They all have grenades, except for they all have hounds. Grenades. Yeah, so look, in crew detachments, solid, but outside of that, I'm just going to say situational. Yeah, well, basically, in your, if you're playing the normal Tau detachments here, but we're going to rank it on its best detachment, which is, yeah, I think they're, they're pretty solid in the crew detachment, because you can get them, you can get their strength 7, AP 2, 2 damage um, yeah. with the, that strat. It's not too bad, and it's the only sh real shooting unit that you have, <laughs> so you, like, you have to run it. <laughs> You have to run it, right? So I think it's fair to say that most of the crew stuff in the crew detachments is going to be, and this is what I like, right? I'll say it now. Every crew unit is not going to be below solid choice in the crew detachment. But when we're looking in the tower ones, it's all about points. At the end of the day, yeah. like a crew tox rider in a cow detachment and stuff, well, you've already got like loads of ways of scoring behind enemy lines and stuff like that, so why are you taking a single crew tox? And you've already got crew with field craft, which will make it sticky. So the need to put a crew tox rider on the back of the board is lesser now. So let's talk about the one unit that, again, wow, the model, the sculpt, the big angry gorilla that's jumping around and a crew riding on top of it. What is there not to love about this unit? I think <clears throat> these are going to be... I'd like to say solid choice, but I'm stuck between solid choice and situational. And the reason I've come to that conclusion is that the only application from a tactical position that I'm seeing is the way that you can really manipulate the uh, mortal wounds in the charge phase, kill something, and then pile into something else because you're still eligible to fight because you've made a charge. So if you go in, finish something off with the mortals, because on a 4+, plus, uh, for every rampager that gets in engagement range, they do D3 mortal wounds on a 4+. plus. So if you get one or two off then you're doing an average of what between two and four mortal wounds so it's really good for finishing things off <clears throat> you could have a katana on a couple of wounds and um, but these are all situational right um but the problem is they're not infantry they're mounted and i think they're on 40 mil bases are they so are they not bigger bases i'd have to look 
I think there was a size comparison model, and I think they're on the same as a crisis suit. Or so maybe is that fifty mil? Yeah, 50 yeah, mil. fifty mil. I think they're on a fifty mil base. I think yeah, fifty mil. Um, so they're going to be quite tricksy to place properly. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd probably say it's fair to say situational, but I can definitely see them um, popping off with those combinations. Maybe you have a unit in rapid ingress coming in from rapid ingress and then going to harass them. I think that's where they're going to live. Rapid ingress or in a crew detachment, you can loan up them. But outside of that, I think they just fold because they've not got stealth. Yeah. Um, I think it's unfortunate that they're on such big base sizes with this rule. You know, mm. the other things like Blood Crushers have it, and it's still hard to pull off for those. So yep. I think it's a good rule on a on paper, but in practice and getting the models in those positions, it can be quite tricky. If it was just the unit makes the charge and then you roll for each model in your unit, then it's a good roll. But now it's it's a little bit situational, and they don't offer any gun. And then the Hunting Blade, which is supposed to be the extra combat weapon you get, is not very good. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets Lance, whereas the Rampager Fists don't get Lance. Uh, I really think that that's definitely a mistake. This thing should hit harder than the Crutox Riders. Because in the lore, the Rampagers are the young, agile, aggressive versions of the Crutoxes, and so they should hit harder. Right? Yeah. <laughs> nope. Turns out the big beast that's just chilling with its fist down on the ground is just better. <laughs> I think situational is fine. But if they get ludicrously cheap, then they, they obviously get much better. Yeah. So I think situational, um, but I can see they're so close to being solid choice. So you're getting, going to get them in the new box set, so people are going to want to run them. And you know what? My, rapid, my advice to you is if you want to run them, think about rapid ingress. And if you're in the crew detachment, then loan up them and then just push them up the board. So, pounds. I think these are straight up probably solid choice to tournament staple. I think they're solid choice. I think... Solid choice. Okay. Yeah. I but couple of scenarios where yeah, you can really make these annoying um one of them being the advance and uh charge if they're within uh six of friendly crew infantry units so you could layer your trail you know finder with your fast stalkers and then a hound unit just going in charging something that's not going to kill them and then move blocking and hemming your opponent in with their tanks and stuff so i think crew hounds are now going to really be able to go super far. And with the advance and charge, the scout moves 7, then the move 12, 19, plus an advance, an average advance, 3, that's 22, and then a charge. First turn. Crazy good. Yeah, what and as, as good as that is, like that is quite solid for what should be a relatively low points investment, you already do have the combos with the tra Trail Shaper and the Far Stalkers. And so with the... With that ability prog being taken regardless, do you need this extra layer? I mean, you could have one extra layer, but I don't think you need like layers and layers of crude hounds. Um, and now, one of the things about them is they gained plus one OC if they're near a crude model, a crude character yeah. model within 12 and 1, which is very good. I think their use outside of the, um, the crude detachment is in Monka, where with Strategic Conquer, you can also give them plus one OC. The only downside there is, once again, they're crude, so they won't proc when they die the uh, full reroll strat. Um, so you still might not see them there, but they're at least a cheap little action thing for secure no man's land or uh, you know, uh, getting area denial points for you, because they'll control the space now, potentially. But uh, they're totally, exactly. they're, their combat yeah. literally does nothing. Like The damage output of this unit is literally zero. Yeah. I can see the pure Thai teachings are strong with this one. Figuring out the Conqueror thing with the uh, extra OC, I like that. That's yeah. nice. Oh, so if, if you have man. a crew character, they're a trail shaper. They could be OC <laughs> too. <laughs> and they're they're five model units now instead of four. Yeah, yeah, man. So yeah. you could actually have pets potentially OC ten, which exactly. is five doggos. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny. Woof woof. Go away. It's mine. <laughs> nice. And then last crew what? unit is the Far Stalkers. Um, for me. Solid choice. Yep, just it's a great unit uh, with that Trail Shaper. You can pull off a lot of combos with it that you previously couldn't. Its damage output, once again, even though it has a bunch of cool-looking models and weapons, is still negligible. And that, yeah. that's a problem. And then it doesn't interact with the other Tau units, which means basically they don't get higher because of that. I think the, the loan up, if he gets cheap enough, the Calamandra mm -hmm. guy, he could have play as just cheap Fire and Fade loan up being annoying. Yeah. 
and then the uh, the sticky objectives on the crude is worth it. But outside of that, I think everything else is just solid. Yeah, there's some nice little combos you can do with the... I think the one thing that used to differentiate the Fast Talkers from the crew is that the Fast Talkers had pistols, so you could do actions in combat, but now crew have pistols. Mm -hmm. So it's all synergized to be able to... Well, if I'm in combat, which is where the crew kind of want to be sometimes, um, but the pistols helps doing actions and things like that. But the Fast Talkers for the infiltrating crew, they're nice. And by the way, if you haven't already picked up Fast Talkers, they are a gorgeous kit to build and paint. So I awesome. thoroughly enjoyed them. Yep. Um, I, I, one of my... Them and the Calamandra guy are my favorite out of them. Yeah. Because they're so they have so much character to the unit, which is great. Okay, piranhas. So well, no, I've been I've been doing a lot of talking. You go for the piranhas, man. Okay, I'll go for the piranhas. So it's a 14-inch moving vehicle that has a nine-inch scout move, and it's T77 wounds, four up save. Um, for 55 points, and that was true in the index, it's true in the codex, and it'll probably stay the same. And it carries a fusion along with two seeker missiles. This is a very solid vehicle, uh, in my opinion. Now, why, when you look at Talus, oh, and then its last rule is at the end of your movement phase, you can pick an enemy unit within 12 and then force a battle shock test, which can be cool if you have a multiple of them and you can force multiple battle shock tests, kind of like Tyranids. And what you're really doing is stopping them from using strats because um, they're going to unbattle shock uh, in the opponent's turn. So it's really to, you know, like a custodian unit, you give them three battle shock tests, maybe they fail one of them, and then they can't use minus one damage that turn. That's pretty interesting. Now, why, with all that said, why don't you see this unit as often as you would think? Because I think a lot of armies would run quite a few of these. And the reason is, is because every good unit in Tau pretty much is a vehicle. And. You can go into games and just say your opponent gets 20 regardless on your uh, on uh, Bring It Down. But these guys bleed them really easily. Um, and I don't think that's a problem in Monka. I think in Monka you can run the solo ones and just force them out. Your opponent has to put something to kill them. Uh, and then if they do, you get four rerolls against the target for the rest of the game. That's worth it. I'm worth, worth giving up Bring It Down points. But at the end of the day, against very good players... If you're giving up the bring it down, they're going to take homers or whatever in addition to it. So they're sitting at a safe, like, 35 secondary points, potentially more. And then the primary, if you aren't designed to beat them on primary, which piranhas take away from your devilfish and your your um, preacher packages, then, like, are you really creating the big enough score differential? And if you're in a team's environment especially, these guys really go against creating a score differential. So I think it's a great data sheet that's held back by the fact that so many Tau things are vehicles. I really think the battle suits, like the commanders, the crisis suits, just should be battle suit. And that should have, you know, battle suit and fly and not be vehicles in addition. I think that really hurts the faction overall because of the match play secondaries. Or bring it down gets changed for something else. Um, I think pun it punishes certain factions a little too hard is my opinion on it. Um, maybe maybe what you do is you uh, you cap it. If you pick bring it down, you can pick an, another sec. Bring it down's capped at ten points, and then a second you can pick another secondary alongside it that'll be capped at ten points. That could be interesting, but I think it's a too, too punishing for Tal, and that's why I don't see, think Tetras are tournament staples. I think they're just a solid choice. Piranhas, yeah, um, yeah. The um, it's a shame about the bring it down, but I can definitely um, see some lists. Running, I mean, I think one of the lists that I ran at the very beginning was just like a three inch to two piranhas and just going full send. But that's because the meta at the time was I got away with like something new. Um, the seekers are nice, fusion's nice, especially in uh, the monk car. You can just push up a side advance and still fight your seekers. Yeah, and it's melt but... a four. Like, why is it melt a four over the other ones? I don't know, but it is. <laughs> it's a super duper fusion. Yeah. So, yeah, I agree. Solid choice. Yeah, I think it, the like the, the actual data sheets in this book hold this back, even though it's a good data sheet for its points. Yeah, it's that vehicle thing. All right, take away the broadsides. So our lumbering broadside bros, these guys slap. They are really good. They were good in the index. They're good now. And finally, especially in the Mont car, we're gonna see missile sides. Because it's still really durable. Broadsides are running through the stats, still the same. T6, 2 plus save, 8 wounds. Okay? 
They've got the 4 plus against mortal wounds, which again is situational. But I think that what we used to be taking them, uh, sorry, the loadouts we used to be taking them is mainly been the rails, the missile drones, because they were AP2. Now they're not, they're only AP1. Uh, you used to have like plasma or some list had SMS and the seeker missile. Give them the tetras and suddenly just watch them delete most stuff in the game. Missile side sat on the shelf gathering dust. <laughs> but now, with Monkar, you can actually have a broadside unit with the enhancement of the scout moving character. You could go scout move six. Then they can actually move five, and you could spend the aggressive ability and advance them. And then they're going 17 inches in turn one. A broadside unit. Yes, that's right. A broadside unit almost going the same speed as a Cold Star Crisis suit from the Index. <laughs> <laughs> so I can really see the application of a big unit of broadsides, whether they move missiles with the full rerolls to hit from maybe Tetras, and then full rerolls to wound because it's twin linked with the high up missile pods. And then you could do extra AP, so they become AP2, strength 7, damage 2, lots of shots and plus the Seekers, and then the Smart Missiles. So I think you're going to see Missile Sides back, and then Rail Sides are still going to do what they do, but better because of, obviously, the Advance and still Shoot. So I think the time of the Broadsides is now, especially in Monkar. Yeah, Monkar is the thing that it's really good. Because Retaliation Cadre, it, it technically buffs them, but like, how often are you really going to benefit from that? But Monkar significantly buffs them in ways that they really needed. So I absolutely think they fit in there. Now, they do overlap somewhat. Uh, so if you're going for all the Breacher Fish packages or you're going for the Fire Knife units, those units want the plus one AP. So you might have a situation where a lot of things want the plus one AP and only certain ones can get it. So that could be a limitation. You decide which ones you prioritize. Also, it really wants the aggressive mobility. Um, so being able to have a Farsight unit in there is pretty important, so you could use it on the broadsides, then use it on Farsight's unit. Um, but it is legitimately, you can actually take missile sides for the first time in 10th edition and not feel bad about it in Monka, absolutely. And then they're just good overall in the detachment. <clears throat> I think you will see them more often than not in a lot of Monka lists. And I, I think yeah. you can actually drop a Riptide and like something else to try and grab the bigger unit of them. Um, but I don't think it's mandatory, for sure. Yeah, because if they stay the same points at 90 points a model, then most people have been taking uh, broadsides in units of two because it's the most efficient to down a target like a, a vehicle. Uh, but with the missile sides, there is potential of going up to three just to kind of pump everything into one unit and really maximize the stratagems that you're using. So I think broadsides are going to be tournament staple, um, especially in monk car builds, but then obviously they're still a solid choice overall in others. But the way that Shane, the, sorry, the detachment that makes them shine is definitely monk car. All right, uh, I'm gonna drop the Calamandra uh, down just so I open up a slot because we have like two more things that are gonna go in tournament staples. Um, <laughs> so I'm gonna just drop it down. It, it, it deserves to be up there when it gets cheaper points, but I'm gonna drop it down for now. I agree that you're putting it in front of Shadow Sun. No, put it in front of Shadow Sun. Shadow Sun, keep it in front of Shadow Sun. <laughs> it's a better loan option. It's the same strength as her fusions, less AP, <laughs> but more shots potentially. Yeah. Uh, it's good and in fire inbuilt fire and fate like that's that's just solid yeah exactly one. so okay go on take it away with the riptide all right so this once again is conditional on the points because riptides have been all over the map they started as utterly unplayable and if you go by the codex points here they will be once again um then they got cheaper and then they got very cheap in the last status slate cheap enough where they're actually a competitive choice and a tournament staple so who knows where we're going to end up but they didn't get the data sheet change that I really wanted, which was their ion should be a legitimate anti-tank gun. It's literally a giant ion gun. And in that case, they can be more expensive and they can be like a legitimate anti-tank piece that competes with broadsides and hammerheads and et cetera. As of now, they are just going to be the same exact thing. They're very swingy against high toughness stuff, but they can do damage into them because they can survive for multiple turns. But they're, they're an overall just an efficient package for what you get relatively fast it's, it has a bunch of shots it'll have the six ion shots or you can just you can go for the burst cannons in monka and get the extra ap and a bunch of potential more dev wounds um but you'll you'll have like either plasma or fusion maybe sms on there and then you'll have um the missile drones so you do 
a solid amount of damage into things. Lethal hits really helps this unit for sure. You ignore mods, so even if it gets degraded um, or your opponent has stealth, you're ignoring that. And then um, the once per battle dev wounds, it's kind of annoying that some of the other units have just they proc dev wounds. It's not even on all its guns, it's just on one gun. So uh, the data sheet itself is slightly annoying, but you get a four up invuln, 14 wounds, two up save. It is just solid at the points that it currently is at. It is just a good unit that does a bunch of things, doesn't do any of them amazingly well, but does them better than average. And I think just to add, I think the one thing um, that you touched on there was like the data sheet hasn't changed, so therefore the putting it up by points doesn't make sense. Um, if it does, okay, they're probably factored in stratagems. Um, but one thing I really liked and to note with the Riptide is that there's a stratagem to uh, blow up in the Retaliation Cadre, and mm -hmm. this thing does D6. So you could actually run a Riptide in, be aggressive, die, and then blow up, <laughs> and then just do a horrendous amount of mortal wounds everywhere. Yeah, uh, it would be hilarious. Uh, or you roll a bunch of ones and you're like, Riptide, come on, this was the, the come time on, to win that was your time. <laughs> The rip I like goes him. in, witness me. <laughs> yeah, I think they're going to be tournament staple because um, they are just a durable wall that you go, all right, retaliation cadre, rip tides go, hold the lines while our crisis suits can come in and bait the enemy out into bad positioning, position so that your crisis suits can make full effect of their guns. So for me, trip tide is eternal, it always will be, and it's now here to stay again. <laughs> giving all the enemies PTSD about <laughs> Riptides. Riptides. And, uh, yeah, which leads us into the next model that gives people PTSDs. <laughs> PTSDs. Beds. Railgun. So, okay. Hammerheads. What holds us back from taking Hammerheads? It's simply because we were a bit upset that it, the Railgun went from ignoring Vuns to then not, and then we just kind of shelved it, especially in the Index, and I was guilty for that too. I just was like, nah, not bothered. I'll use my broadsides and relied on the broadsides to do all the heavy lifting. Then I kind of got baited into kind of thinking about Hammerheads on a video that I did with Pantheon Studios, and then I ended up taking them um, to the Goonhammer Open. I was actually surprisingly impressed by the hammerheads against guard against a meta pick so they were definitely a meta pick the sms plus the rail guns i could deal with indirect i could have my own indirect to deal with like little small trading pieces hiding behind walls secondary scoring monkeys that kind of stuff but um they've taken a few tools away from us one being that the smart missile system has twin linked on the riptides but doesn't have twin linked on the hammerheads. So I don't know if that's a mistake or they've deliberately taken it away. And then they've kind of fixed the SMS in terms of it used to be like eight for long strikes, six for a hammerhead, four for a devilfish. So they've kind of just given them three shots. So it's got two twin SMSs. But the railgun I still think is good against nothing, uh, anything with, that doesn't have an invuns. Um, it's still a scary gun. Um, and when it connects, it connects. Um, so with the meta being very vehicle heavy, um, the hammerheads have their place. If they stay at the same point that they are, it's a shame long strike has gone away. It does make me sad because it was cool. Um, it was basically a hammerhead that just had one extra BS and the ability to give another one lethal hits. Uh, I still think um, I'd say I'd put them in situational based off my deduction that... Um, it's a meta pick. And right now, situational, but if we think about our anti-tank, is going to be Sunforge Crisis Suits, which people are going to obviously favor over the Hammerhead. Yep. What do you think, Siegler? No, I think you're spot on, is that in a meta where there are tons of vehicles without invulns, the Hammerhead actually gets a lot of value because it's still got the two secret missiles, it's got the plus one to hit, and then it has the rerolls in there. So it's also mm. something that's relatively efficient by itself. Uh, into them, so you don't have to spend too many resources, and that's nice. The issue there is that a lot of good vehicles do have invulns, and then if you do no damage with the hammerhead, all of a sudden you start to fall behind, um, and Tau really does need consistent damage, because um, for the most part, a lot of lists aren't going to be creating a huge score differential, so you need to finish your opponent off really by turn four, so you can have that nice safe 
uh, end of game. And uh, the Hammerhead, boy, can it do a lot of damage, and boy, can if they roll one invuln, uh, you don't do a lot of damage. So, yeah, you just do zero. <laughs> because of its inconsistency, it's very good into specific metas, like team lists can definitely take Hammerheads and be like, I'm going to go into these vehicle heavy lists without invulns, and I'm going to do awesome things with these Hammerheads. But other lists are, I think they're a little too swingy. Um, and that's why I agree with situational for sure. Yeah, and I think even though we're going to pull one out for our long strike boy, may he rest in peace. <laughs> but actually, from a team's environment and a skew list, losing long strike is massive because you could actually just take four hammerheads then. But now we're only going to be able to take three. Yeah. So having that fourth piece, and the one thing I really liked about the hammerheads was it's a separate stat check profile. So in the list, if you really kind of look into detail about my goon hammer list, it's like the ghost kills at T8 with being ghost kill, doing ghost kill things, then the riptides at T9, then the delphish at T9, then the hammerheads at T10, and then 50 infantry. So I was able to layer my army in such a way that actually they've got multiple profiles, and it's a kind of confusing and annoying for an opponent to kind of figure out how to crack it. Um, so hammerheads with the T10 and the 14 wounds, it's nice. So, but again, situational is where they belong for now because we're going to be having fun with our Sunforge suits. Yeah, I, I think it's also yeah, limited by the competitors being very good right now. Yeah. All right, Skyray got a really nice upgrade with that twin linked on its uh, secret missile rack and it's very efficient against fly units with full rerolls, so it doesn't need too many buffs there. And then it also has the native reroll one hit um, or wound roll. So, I am. I know other people are bigger fans of the vehicles. I typically haven't been because I want to put more pressure in the center of the board. And I think they they basically act like riptides. Is they kind of hang out at the edges of the board. They can do you know chip damage over the side and uh, bigger damage into certain targets. But they really need to survive multiple turns, and that's where you get the value out of them. Is they kind of hang back there. You get multiple activations out of them, and then they're they're good. And I think this is a perfectly solid unit. I think it's solid, um, but I think once again, the like big, I just cripple you type of damage, it doesn't do. And so um, I think that stuff at the top, it's really competing directly with the Riptide in my mind, and I prefer the Riptide personally, but I, I don't think you can feel bad about running one. How do you feel about yeah. it? Yeah, I think most of the uh, tanks with Tau um, would fit into situational. I think the Sky Ray is just... You could arguably say that it is so, you know, potentially solid choice, but I think it falls in line with the Hammerhead. Even though it's got its uh, twin linked, it's, then it's AP3, so then there's Armor of Contempt and blah, blah, blah. And then, so I really think that even though you've got reroll wounds, sorry, reroll, um, it's twin linked, um, I still think it's not just going to push it over the edge because it's only got three shots. Yeah, I think low. If it was like two plus D3 or, you know, had one of the better profile, like Tau have very few guns that are three plus D6 shots which some of the other armies mm. have access to. Uh, I guess the Ion is, um, but yeah. unfortunately it's so low strength. But if this was in that category, then absolutely would be bust you'd be like way up. <laughs> um, so yeah, sky rate totally solid, and it fits really naturally into like a crude army where it doesn't really need to be guided, and it can kind of hang back there and, and just do some damage. Devilfish, yep. on the other hand, is straight up tournament staple. Tournament staple, uh, agreed. I have, I have to keep... I'm going <laughs> to... I have to drop something else down. Um... Because hmm. I don't want to keep making this screen smaller and smaller, but honestly, this sh no, this is not the last tournament staple. <laughs> Do you know what? It's fine. Just leave it as it is. <laughs> leave it as it is. Well, I want people to see the devilfish up there. Um, I think we can just say that the cold star is acting as both commanders. And yeah. I'll, okay. I'll drop the enforcer out. Sure. Basically, all commanders go in there. Sweet. Yep. Um, okay. So devilfish agreed. It's not changed. We don't really need to go too much into detail. One thing I would say, though, with the Devilfish, though, is that, you know, you don't always have to have a Devilfish per unit of Breaches. I think somewhere between mm -hmm. two and three Devilfish is nice um, because you can use them as, like, um, a doorway in and out and just going to do primary control things and do Breacher things. So, yeah, don't overload them, but two or three is definitely a staple. Yep, spot on there is I literally use them as relay systems. You get one unit out, get the next one in, keep going from there. Typically, I don't play the orc style where I just throw the transports directly onto the objectives. Um, typically, I'm, I'm saving them. And especially a Moncon now, because you can disembark and get the reroll wounds um, against something mm -hmm. that isn't on an objective. You don't want to just throw away that type of tool. Um, but if you do go out there, go out there with all of it, and your opponent won't 
be able to kill all of it because it is a yeah i chassis. think one thing i would add to the delfish as well if you're in kion you take sms on there and if you're in monk car you take gun drones yep because kion you're keeping your delfish hidden as a relay point and then so the sms you can just keep going and just trickling tickling down little uh, scoring units and in uh Obviously, you could take SMS in Monk Car, but if you want to go aggressive and just go full on full send, then the extra shots are going to help with lethals. But yeah, Delfish are definitely really, really good, solid. And if they remain the same points, then yeah, happy days, 75 points for Delfish all day long. Yep. And this is one of the things like Piranhas are competing with these because you're giving up some amount of bring it down points in the middle of the table. You don't want to give up double. You don't want to do both, is how mm. I feel about it. So <laughs> utterly fantastic. Being able to advance and disembark is huge now that you have flat six advance. So you just go 18, disembark three, 21 inch threat range for breachers. It's huge. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, the two, flyers. the two flyers. Oh. Do we need oh. to really talk about them? No, can we just put them in rally scene? Yeah. They're not, <laughs> the thing is, so they don't have um, the ability to start on the board where they could no. be, do some sort of alpha strike. And in Monkai, you can give them, you know, the turns two and three, the lethal hits. You can mm -hmm. also get access to the plus one AP on them. But then you're doing it on them and not on other resources. And they're not, like, so insanely cheap that you can just willingly do this. They just don't do that much damage. It's better to have something that will shoot multiple turns that's better than these that will shoot likely one time. Yeah. I think um, I was hoping... Maybe in my head I was thinking, I wonder if one of the detachments will be a vehicle detachment like the Borkan or something like that, and and, the, and then just maybe then all the vehicles are going to get great, but there's not a detachment there. So the Flyers remain rubbish, and to be honest with you, they're good because Flyer, Flyer Hammer was horrible, um, and uh, I know we abused the Sunshark Bombers, um, but I just don't like Flyer Hammer. I think it just it makes it a little bit too broken, so I'm glad that they're in the rally scene. Yeah, they're... they're they... Like, you can run the Sun Shark and try and do some sort of weird mortal thing um, and really overload on having all the grenade units and having access to tank shocks and stuff like that, but at the end of the day, it's just you run a normal list and it's stronger, for sure. Storm Surge. Storm Surge. Oh, we said it at the same time, then. Yeah, Storm oh, Surge. The Storm Surge. Uh, it's really hurt um, by the army roll. Yeah. Splitting fire at minus one ballistic skill is not good. Now, you can sit here and it's heavy, but, like, movement is king. Being able to get line of sight is king. You're mostly moving. And if you're standing out in the open and your opponent can't kill you, there are certain armies that are like that, but not too many of the top armies are like that. It has good rules. It's just it's too expensive for what you get from it. Um, and it it's just it doesn't it has so many different weapon profiles, you're never getting the efficiency from all of them. Does the aggressive mobility work on it or not? Uh so it's just let me read it again. I don't know if the aggressive mobility says like battle suit or anything no, like that. No, it's just any unit. You can use it on crew if you wanted to. Hey, well I'll tell you what, look, if you wanted to scout move a storm surge and then move that thing, um auto six fourteen, so that's twenty in storm surge turn one, then hell yeah. <laughs> a monk car. Yeah. Like <laughs> you can get it to shoot. That's not a problem. The problem is is it doesn't do as much damage as like a four hundred point unit should do. And yeah. it it's only four up invul and 20 wounds. It's not yeah. that hard to kill. Um, and then when it blows up in your area, this thing you could... Uh, oh, it's not a battle suit, so you can't auto... No, you can't otherwise if you auto explode it, then... <laughs> you can't auto four up to do D3, but like, whatever. But D6 plus yeah. two would have been hilarious. Um, Full model. It's going to be minimally useful. Um, i probably rarely seen. Yeah, it's, it's down there. Unfortunately, yeah. it's, it needs to go down significantly in points. For it to be seen yeah. with the current rule set. Agreed. Tide wall. Uh, uh, minimal useful because it you can scout move it and potentially a bit do some weird stuff with it. Why would you ever take this over Delfish? Oh, well, you wouldn't. I know. I know you wanted to put it in Red Scene, so let's just get it out of the way. Let's put all the four. Uh, and this... I didn't even grab the picture of the gun rig, but it's also down here. <laughs> <laughs> like, so I'm surprised yeah, they okay. left these in the codex, honestly. They're... Yeah, fortifications are a thing of the past. Um, and I think same with like flyers now as well. If, if you want to get into flyers, play Aer Aeronautica, fortifications, meh, cool little terrain pieces, but they're not doing it for me in terms of gameplay. Tiger Shark. So that's all the codex data sheets. Now we've got Imperial mm. Armor, and some of these are going to be pretty quick, and then there's two of them that stand out. Um, mm -hmm. uh, for a little bit of discussion. So how do you feel about the flyers? 
We got three of them. The Manta, um, obviously, put the is main not. one. Hey, put the main Tiger Shark that's been taken for 275 points into a solid choice and everything else into rarely seen. Okay, so we'll put the Tiger Shark up because it has a decent amount of guns and in Monkai, the plus one AP strat can be used on it, right? Yeah, I believe so. 275 points of that thing to go and do its thing better in Monkai yep. with lethal hits as well. If you can you also minus one like damage it, too. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it is a big gangly flyer, and it's it's awkward. Um, yeah, you really usually get one way. turn, and then it has to be move blocked and stuff like that. But it can still do a really good alpha. Barracuda. I've got one, but I've never used it. <laughs> that's, <laughs> like... that's the definition of rarely seen. <laughs> I mean, I've got one, and it's heavy. And it's like, I used it once, I think, in like... 7th edition. <laughs> I'm going to save us some time on Remoras. They're just ludicrously yeah. expensive. For what expensive. If they, were, if they were cheaper, that reactive move is quite nice. Yeah, I used but, to use yeah. them when they were cheaper, but they're just so insanely expensive. It's ridiculous yeah. how much they're costing. Me, me and you remember the days of putting Remoras in Devilfish because they were classed as a drone, and drones could go in Devilfish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but also the move blocking as flyers. It was quite good. Um, it was quite good, and that stratagem that you could do mortal wounds within three. Long gone are the days of the Remora, and it's a shame because they're gorgeous little kits. Yeah, they're cool. All right, the Arvarna, who can benefit from the Battlesuit Detachment, the Retaliation Cadre. How do you uh, feel about it? I'd say, look, the, they're, just, they're, they're, they're going to be rarely seen until the for, Forge World points. I mean, I like the fact that it's a little bit tougher. I think it's got an extra wound, and it's got that ability to uh, minus one wound, uh, minus one to wound it. So, not bad. Shooting's not bad, but it's kind of slow, so it's not really going to be working in the Retaliation Cadre and the Monk Car one, the advancement, advancing it's going to help, but again, it's just more points than a Riptide, so why would you? You get a special Riptide with an extra wound and extra toughness, uh, but it's slower, um, and its guns are suffer from AP, which you could increase it, but again, I think it's going to be some little fun list that you could do, but from a tournament point of view, you're, not gonna, you're rarely going to see it. The Townar, on the other hand, if you like the Townar, it mm -hmm. can get pretty much all the Monka buffs. And at that point, it does do a lot of interesting things, like minus one damage on it is kind of silly, because uh, I, I don't think that excludes Titanic. Uh... Think, yeah, it's just a Tau Empire unit. <laughs> Lol. So it has more uses than it previously did. I think it's minimally useful. Like It has some good guns. It is just very expensive for what you get for it. But it is actually yeah. a killer. And I actually do, to be fair, even if people are just going to tournaments for like the mid-table and having some fun, I do see quite a few Taunars popping up here and there. I don't know what it's like when you go to tournaments, but you do definitely usually see a Tau player with a Taunar somewhere. I used to be the guy running the Taunar at those tournaments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that was when he had crushing feet and you were like stomping and, on people, right? <laughs> and I could, Well, I could also pass off all the wounds to drones. That was the Yeah, let's not time. forget about that. I've never owned a Taunar, you see. Otherwise, oh, I would be that so guy. epic. Um, right before I end the stream, I have it literally over there. I'm going to go grab it just so we can end <laughs> on that epicness. Remind me before I end it. I will do. Okay. Then we have, uh, okay, the one auto take here, which is Tetris. Um, I obviously, we, we would both agree that in the index, if we you know back in when we did the other uh, tier list, we just shoved it straight to tournament staple. But I actually think now that they're just more of a solid choice, I don't think they're an, uh, maybe like one unit. Um, would be a tournament staple, but I don't think you're going to see multiple uh, Tetra units. And actually, I set a challenge from me and my um, students and be like, actually, drop the crutch. Drop Tetras and focus on Piranhas and stuff like that. And now that they've got considerably better, um, I don't see it automatically going to be a to tournament staple, but I can definitely see one unit being a tournament staple for the Sunforge. Um, but that's, it's still, a, for me, it's a solid choice. That's where I was going, is um, the Sunforge unit loves the Tetras, and I think you're going to see Sunforge in a, quite a good amount of lists, whether the Kadra or Monka uh, or Kalyan. So I think they fit very naturally, uh, buffing those units, but they do have more competition than they previously had. And like you said, in Monka, you don't really need more than one. Like, two units is, is already a lot because you can proc the full reels in other places. So they are, I've been running one. And I think one is absolutely a tournament staple, but spamming them is... The other ones are just solid. Uh, and they're fast. Yeah. They're fast. They're very, much more durable than stealth suits, so they can survive and take some hits. You can minus one damage them in Monka, which I did against Nick, and then he was like, wow, this is insane. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, you're a bad man, like, you I, minus one damage on Tetras that are already T7. I, I did, and he, the, the Super Lord of Change rolled six, or like five or six sixes to hit for sustained. Still didn't kill the last one. Seven <laughs> wounds, minus one damage. Yeah, it was nutty. Uh, but then I was like, uh, yeah. He, he, yeah, we uh, watch the game. You'll see. Yeah, uh, I'm, go I'm going to, and this is why Tau players don't have any friends, because we pull stuff like this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll put it at solid choice because I think that one guy is absolutely tournament staple, but I'm running out of space yeah. there. So I'm going to just put it at the front of solid choice. Makes sense. Um, Yavara. So same thing as the Arvana, but I actually think the Yavara is more of a popular than the Arvana, so it's going to be minimally useful because there is a janky thing that we can do with the um, ability that it's got, which is basically in any phase you can pop this and you get um, a Nova boost to going 18 inches. Um uh, effectively so what you can actually do with the way that the stratagem of the torch star gambit um you can do this ability in any phase so you do it in the shooting phase so when you fire and fade it you can go 18 inches so rather than doing it in the movement phase you do it in your shooting phase um and then you just go wee and fly away the damage is meh it could be better um, it should be better because the Avara has always been known for its uh, super duper flamer and a stupid iron gun as well. Um, but unfortunately, it's a bit lackluster when it comes down to that. But the Avaras are a popular model, and I've seen some lists rocking a couple of them. But in the Retaliation Cadre, you get that extra AP, you get that extra strength, so it helps out a little bit. So, you know, minimally useful, I'd say. So, big picture. This is pretty well. Yeah, you can see most of the bottom is the dumb fortifications, the planes, and Forge World units. But the Codex units, they're pretty close together. There's a lot of stuff that's either tournament staple or just very solid that you no issues with taking. Now, the crude stuff is ranked based on if it gets actual points and in its detachment. But then there's the Carnivores, who are just good in all of the different detachments. And you can not feel bad about taking Far Stalkers as well. So I'm very happy with the internal balance of the Codex. I think it's mm. way better than we started at the beginning of the Index, where there was, you was basically start with six Crisis Suits plus a Commander, and then you built the rest of your list around that. I think there's a lot more options, and the different detachments make different things better, uh, which is always very interesting. So I feel very good about this Codex. I know a lot of people have been uh, more on the negative side of things about what Tau has lost, but I think the MSU style just plays 10th edition better. And then Retaliation, Kadra, and Monka offer two play styles that really let you play the early game significantly better than before. And that means that Tau are always in the game. And that's where you want to be. Is It comes down to your decisions, your generalship, and the moves that you're making. And I think Tau play that brilliantly. How do you feel? Yeah. I'm really excited. Um, and I think... Um, when I've had time to digest a few things that were maybe um, a bit of a shock and I think it's not necessarily that I uh, I don't have a problem with like people expressing different opinions and being frustrated because there are you know we're spending a lot of money on this hobby um, but I think it's the fear of change or adapting to change mm -hmm. and I think change is good from a personal perspective uh, I know um, I'm always quite a positive person, but I'm always looking for a new problem to solve or like I see 40k as a big puzzle. And I think Tau, now that we've got loads of different tools, um, we've got a bigger toolbox to play with. We've got more straps, different detachments, and we've always been very good at reacting with the meta. Now it's even better. Now we can actually carve our own path in the meta and be a strong force to contend with. So I'm super excited. And then when I got the stuff on the table, we were having a couple of practice games just to looking at the current points and thinking how units would work. And I was super surprised. And then like, oh my God, the retaliation cadre, the crisis suits, the fire knife. I was like, this is great. And it's just made me fall in love with it more than I've just been looking on paper. Actually putting my models on the table and practicing this stuff has made it so much more fun. Yeah, and I agree. I, I've had a lot of fun playing uh, the games that I've gotten in. I'm going get, to get tons more games coming soon. So hopefully people enjoyed this tier list. Like we said, this is mostly based on the points for current MFM, plus mm -hmm. new units, what they have in the codex, slash just valuing their data sheet itself over uh, the specific points. So things can change, and uh, we may do a little addendum here uh, whenever we get that MFM to do a little update. But overall, I think... If the points stay relatively where they are, the crude stuff comes down, 
uh, we're going to be in a very nice spot for Tau, and I think they, Tau can stay in this spot for a lot of the edition because the codexes aren't like 9th edition, where each one is just ludicrously more powerful than the previous one, just ratcheting up the power level of the game. We're in a nice spot where the game is relatively here, each new book fits alongside that, and then the balanced data slate will bring the stuff that's up here, down there, the stuff that's down here, up here, and it'll hopefully, when we're in that area, start continuing to smooth the uh, internal balance of these books, and that's going to be the perfect spot to be. So if you like this type of content, please give us a like, subscribe to the channel, and tell your friends about us. All of that massively helps. In addition, leave a comment below letting us know what you thought about the tier list, what you're most excited for in the 10th edition Tau book. And then once again, uh, it's been my great pleasure to be joined here by Mr. Kyle Grundy. So Kyle, if you don't, if you want to give uh, kind of a synopsis where people can find you, where they can uh, get your different ideas and your takes, um, I'm going to go grab the Townar while you do that, and then uh, mm -hmm. we'll sign off. Yes, yeah, so the best thing that uh, to do is straight off go up to my YouTube channel. I'm growing it up to slightly, and me and Richard are going to be doing a video um, together on over on my channel. So please go and check it out and let, like, comment, and subscribe. And then if you click on the links available in my YouTube, you can find the hive of activity in the community Discord that I've created. Uh, there's a free option because everybody loves talking about Tau, so do I, and I'm really active on there. Um, and then if you want to kind of take your game to the next level and you really want kind of like the coaching, the tactics and everything like that, I do offer subscription tiers and I'm also available for one-to-one -one coaching. So main thing is come and join the community, get a feel for stuff. And if you want to take yourself to that next level, you can DM me privately or go onto the information part of the Discord. It helps so, yeah. you that you are just such a lovely person. It really oh, helps. Thank you. I mean, to be honest with you, mate, this is why we, we do this. So are you. We um, really take pride in the faction that we love. And one thing I've noticed is that when, when we're met with any negativity, we try and rally the troops, if you will, and say, hey, guys, calm down. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Let's think about this. So, and I take that very seriously. I know you do. And we take pride in um, having the community. I, I don't like to say look up to us, but they come to us for help and innovation. And I really like that. And I'll never um take that role for granted yeah we take pride in that role is yes. you know we're trying to be positive beacons for the tau community and both of us genuinely believe in this book we're not just telling you that we're not in shields for games workshop when there's bad rules like admet codex i was all about telling it saying it was bad but i think yeah. this tau book is there's a lot to be positive about um, so thank you so much for joining us. If you want to see any of the Tau content that I'm producing, check out The Worm, theworm.vhx.tv. There's a three-day free trial for it in the description below. And uh, you can also find in that description uh, the lovely uh, link to Mr. Kyle and all the things that he's doing. So please do check it out. The more content that you support for Tau, the more that we can uh, produce, the more tournaments we'll go to and show you all the cool tricks and uh, stuff that we're figuring out. And we just want to make uh, Competitive 40K as accessible as possible and get that knowledge to you uh, in the best ways uh, that we can. So thank you so much. Thank you, Kyle, for joining me. And uh, sure. we'll see you in the comments because I definitely be reading them and uh, I know Kyle will as well. So thank you so much. We'll see you. And the town R is signing off. So long for now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.